Welcome, mercenary captains, to the region of Vertrus. Truly a beautiful and bountiful land, perfect for a mercenary company to be able to make their fortune. Vertrus has not one, but two towns, both of which have emissaries that will be able to give you quests and pay out completed quests. Now, Brown Rock Town is a more minor settlement. They only have a blacksmith along with the tavern that is housing the emissary, but Marham is going to be the main center of population and is just teeming with quests for you to be able to pick up and has all of the usual opportunities with the apothecary and all of the other service buildings buildings that you would expect in one of the full-fledged towns. We also have the Vertrusian Jail down in the southern portion of the region, and all of these combine into giving you a lot of great pit stops for being able to progress throughout the region and make a lot of money. The hallmarks of the region are expansive vineyards, most of which are mysteriously plagued at the time you arrive, and a network of rivers and bridges that will see you through to the different portions. So you're going to want to plan your routes carefully as you go to different portions of the map because getting from one point to another might cause you to have to take a very roundabout route to be able to go through the bridges to get where you need to be. We're going to walk through the main storyline of the region, culminating in the fate of Vertrus, and then look at the most significant combat encounters and finally cover all of the minor encounters and the secrets that you can find dotted throughout the region. Check the timestamps if you're looking for anything in particular, but let's get started. The capital city of Marheim has so much going on, this is the perfect place to start. The first thing that will take you here is the Companion's Tale, which is the quest from the Path of Power and Might. They are a predominant, kind of the, the ultra-professional mercenary company in the entire country, and they are based here in Vertrus. If you come to town and start talking to anyone, they will probably mention that the new sewers installed by the university have an unbearable stench. So because we are a mercenary company and this is a role-playing game, we are naturally going to go down into the sewers. Once we pick the lock, we are confronted with these hideous little guys. Little mole rats. Let's inspect them before we uh, go up. If you have already done the dungeon delve in Arthas, then these guys may seem familiar to you. You have probably had to kill far too many of these already. They have the nibbling attack here, which just does a small amount of damage with a significant increase. If the uh, person they're attacking is already engaged with another one of the mole rats allies, they have strength in numbers, increasing their damage even more, and then cover of darkness. So here is where having torches within your company is actually going to come to be significant and you want to get visibility of these. Otherwise, they're able to vastly increase their damage, striking from the shadows. <laughs> uh, 36 mole rats, what could go wrong? Ah, fascinating. We're actually not fighting them in the dark, so torches, torches optional here. Well, after a full round of combat, we have evened up the numbers to be outnumbered a mere three to one. Oh, why are there so many of them? And we're fighting in the rain now. Now just to sweep away the last of the rats and we should be able to get into their nest. Be able to throw up the overwatch here, and I'm loving the area of effect that we get off of this bow. There we go. Definitely leaning on my archers a lot in this scenario. Also, you cannot discount the harpooner when you can do stuff like this. And pick up valor points for every rat you pick off when you use that. Ah, it's so good. Or somebody was sneaking around behind us. Well, there we go. <laughs> Crits for 79 damage. Yeah, I don't think the rat was going to be able to take that. There we go, the last of them run away, fleeing into the sewers, and we get 34 carcasses, okay, okay, 42 rat bodies, sure, so they, they multiplied when they died, a whole lot of teeth and a whole lot of leather. We're now seriously over encumbered and able to inspect their nests, great camera angle, the nest obstructs wastewater drainage, so we can burn it with a torch. Or we can just leave. Well, time to burn it out. Strange, the market doesn't stink quite as much now. Yeah, now that all the refuse wasn't piling up on the, the mole rat nest. Heading back to the Lady Mayoress will allow you to complete that quest. So this doesn't extend the main story, but you do get a nice little bit of influence. And honestly, the biggest reward that you're pulling out of that mission is being able to get all those extra teeth that you can use at the trackers. 
Next on our list of quests here at Marhem, we can talk to Treasurer Nina. Or Nima? Nima. She cannot figure out where the crowns are going. They are being robbed blind. Well, if we inspect the chest over here, it is locked. I've already picked the lock. And here we see the Lord Mayor's documents shows an important location for Marhem's Lady Mayoress. We'll have to steal it to be able to get a good look at it. And this is guaranteed to significantly increase our suspicion. So, only do so if you are ready to be pursued by the guards. As we show the map, we can see a coastal rat infestation with a, with a convenient little question mark. Some area that we will need to investigate. And there we are. Now we are wanted. So... We're going to be have to be on the run from the law as we complete these next pieces. We head into the apothecary to pick up the next quest line. We have Look Beos here. I'll never convince Jorum to sell up. My offer for this dump is more than generous. Why won't he settle? It's been two weeks since his uncle's disappearance, and his nephew and apprentice is still waiting for his return. How can we make him understand the old apothecary has gone into the light? Speaking with Joran here gives us a couple opportunities. He is looking for an escort because the truce is rife with bandits and wild animals. Oh, I know. So we will be able to receive 50 crowns, a recipe, and additional progress on our quest to the fate of Vertrus. We can also question him about the strange tuber, which is jumping ahead a little bit, but you can pick these up in multiple locations amongst the dead vineyards here in Vertrus. The folds in its skin are reminiscent of a human face. Let's see what the apothecary has to say about this, and then we will pick up his quest. Use strange tuber. No, it doesn't ring a bell, I'm afraid. My uncle would probably know, but I'm just an apprentice. Are you sure you found this in Vertrus? Yeah, I mean, they're everywhere. Actually everywhere. If you get more, I'd be willing to buy them off you. Who knows what I could make of them? Well, who knows what I could make of them if we really figure out what they are. So, we will accept his quest to, uh, you've gained Apothecary's meeting place, taking him to this location. This is the meeting place. If you ever need to buy any potions, you can always bring me back here so that I can prepare some. Okay. And we will now recruit him and add him to the party. So they are set to meet by the Circle of Stones out by the riverbank, a place we'll have to adventure and discover. As we cross the bridge into Brown Rock Town, and if we pull up the map, you'll be able to see right where we are coming up to our ideal location to Brown Rock Town right here. We just follow the main path past the Juggler's Camp, Brown Rock Town, take a left. <laughs> feel like I'm some old faba giving you directions. Come over to the field of, or the standing stones, circle of stones. It doesn't look quite as much like a circle uh, as it used to. But now we have this little point to examine, and suddenly a group of enemies appear. Don't move, Apotho. Wait, who are you? The apprentice was meant to be alone. Lieutenant Richick is here. This unknown gang was hiding behind a bush waiting for you with foot soldiers, phalanx soldiers, and the lieutenants. Is he perhaps connected with the man trying to purchase the apothecary? Now, Richick here is the leader, but he's not providing a bonus to any of his companions. We don't have to worry about focusing him down. He is still going to be a super combatant because he has dexterity and strength and constitution, all increased by 30% compared to other characters of his level. Thankfully, our apothecary apprentice doesn't have any aspirations of being a fighter, so we don't have to worry about babysitting him in this encounter. We should have a pretty straightforward fight here to be able to knock out these this band this band of gang or whatever they want to call it but they seem to all have the guard stat lines I don't think these guys expected to meet quite as much resistance as we are going to give them ah <laughs> oh, tough as a monster now that the gang has been dealt with in a magnificent critical strike we can pick up the spoils and progress our story. Oh, we got we got fish oil. I'm pretty sure that's random, but it is so nice because it seems to be a bottleneck for the apothecary crafting. By the beast fangs, what is going on? Who were these men? Why were they here where I was supposed to meet my uncle? Could he be in danger? And we gain the golden key. All I could find on them was this key. We must figure out what it opens. 
And here we get a impressive look at the uh, one of the champions, one of the bosses of the zone, standing up on his little uh, plateau out there. Now we have our next stop in the quest already marked on the map. It is going to be right up here. There is an abandoned manor that has a lock that the golden key will fit. I'm not sure if it's on the map because I've already discovered the location. I've opened up everything to be able to show off the entire map here um, or if it will actually give you the, um, the icon here as soon as you progress to this stage of the quest. But either way, we know our next destination. Traveling all the way up into the mountains past the brown rock mine avoid the boars and you'll be able to make it up to the manor when you do find the old manor you can hop right up it is completely deserted and then it's a little hidden over here but the trap door is right in the back by the barrels and the stairway locked use a golden key wait are you sure you want to go down what if there's another trap yeah go down anyway wildolf ador feiden what took you so long was it that difficult to capture a mere apprentice? Ha ah, ah. We have surprised Wildolf der Feiden, the captain, level 5 encounter with foot soldiers, failing soldiers, and lieutenants. This time, interestingly enough, the captain is providing the movement bonus to his entire team, but his own stats are not amplified beyond what a normal archer of his level would have. He does have the Volley of Arrows, the Crit Bow, which uh, is a very coveted bow for me. I would love to be able to get my hands on that, but we'll have to see if RNG favors us to be able to give us that loot at the end of the battle. With the mysterious gang dealt with, we see the old apothecary is dead. Joran wants to stay with his uncle, so he will leave the party and we will gain all of our quest rewards. The recipe that we are given is the Remedy Imparfait, a cure prepared with love and care, but no particular knowledge. The flask is recovered after use. And so this is using half of the materials of real medicine. And so this is going to be an imperfect remedy. You can use it to try and cure your character's wounds, uh, but it will have a percent chance of failing, whereas medicine is guaranteed. I will mention that right in this area are the new recruits that there is occasionally going to be a bounty for, sending out help for them for the companions. The companions asked us to get out here, and now they've come into trouble and their supplies are dwindling, so we can either give them medical assistance or give them food and extra assistance, or we can just leave them be, but we get the, uh, the extra bounty if we help them out, so we're, we're pretty topped up on cured meat. We're going to go ahead and hand those over. We're going to pick up the next stage of the quest here at the Alazar Abode. Speaking with Brunhilde Adder Alazar, she will give you a quest to capture a very important and unnamed woman who's going to be traveling in a caravan along this route. So we have this update on our map. We're going to go down and see who this is. She does not give us very much information on who this person of interest really is. Here we have found our target, Corrine. So she is being escorted by a group of companions, and all we know is that her caravan often visits the Windfell Estate. So you have the destination of their route, but then they will be roaming around, following the roads and whatnot. Here they're out in the vineyards for some reason, but we're going to track her down and capture her. Corrine's caravan, level 5, with hired killers, ravagers, and crewmates. Corrine herself is nothing to worry about, she just works as an unarmed civilian, but the group that she's traveling with is pretty handy warriors, so we're going to have to be smart in how we play this out. Now the knockout ability is also uniquely set up in this encounter so that you don't have any of the usual restrictions on being able to use it. You can just use it against any enemy at any time, so capturing Corrine is a really not an issue whatsoever. Your prisoner seems important. The guard and companions are on high alert. Well, now we just have to make it back to the Alazars, dodging everyone we see on the road. And we had just worn off our suspicion from stealing the mayor's map. Well, well, what have we got here? Hand over the prisoner. Hiring you was the right decision after all, as it always is. We gain a pristine essence, 100 crowns, and another 20 progress toward the fate of Vertrus. We just got a pop-up. According to rumor in Vertrus, the broker's fiancé has gone missing. I wonder, did we have anything to do with that? 
Now back to following the thread of the Lord Mayor's documents. If you look at the map, once again, we see a infected rat nest right on the coast next to these hills. Sure looks like it could be in this location. And we got a camp, but then we are going to go and investigate along the beach. We have this little uh, splatter that we can inspect right here. On the outside, it definitely blends in with the way the, uh, the rats are set up and we gain 200 crowns. Once we found the buried treasure of crowns, we're able to go back and talk to treasurer Nima here. Doesn't understand where the city's money is going. We can warn them. Tell the treasurer that the lady mayoress is embezzling funds and that will give us a little boost to our influence. We are still thankfully able to keep the money, uh, which is Kind of incredible. I was expecting that when you spoke with them, you would have to make the decision on keeping the crowns and actually warning them or handing them back over to the city. But mercenaries life for us. Take it all and give nothing back. This path has taken us right up to the loop of vineyard, which looks extremely different from all of the other vineyards here in Vertrus. It is thriving. It is still alive. How is this possible? Well, let's dig in and see what is going on. We find that the owner of the vineyard was attacked on the previous night and her household was barely able to drive off the assailants. She now wants to hire mercenary protection for her vineyard at night. Perfect. You must be in the fields by nightfall and guard the place until dawn. We're going to get a little bit of a feel for the fields here and then we're going to go ahead and make a camp so that we are going to be fresh and totally topped up by the time evening rolls around. I like how the mission on the map says protect the vineyard from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m., but then the clock they give you is on the 24-hour time rotation. So uh, <laughs> a little bit out of sync there, but here we see another band marked very similarly to the one that had kidnapped the apothecary earlier on. Hey, looks like the old loop woman hired some mercenaries. What a surprise. If only we hadn't called in more men. Our opponents at this time are led by a hoodlum named Thayet. He has just a basic poisoning dagger. He's got nothing special about him whatsoever, so you don't have to worry about the enemies having any captains or any unique effects. And these are pretty much the same style of enemies as we have been fighting before. They have the phalanx soldiers that are ready to destabilize your characters. Big mace swingers ready to inflict bleeding if they hit the armor and a number of heavily armored foot soldiers as well. Vanquishing our opponents sees that they are carrying a strange tuber, one of the ones that we have picked up from the other vineyards and already shown to the apothecary's apprentice. He had no idea what it was, but he was willing to buy it off of us, believing that they could be valuable. It is clearly some kind of conspiracy to damage the vineyards. And here we get to speak to the owner of the vineyard. Ah, well done. What a bloodbath. Now that they're all dead, how will I know why they attacked my vineyard? Well, maybe it was this strange tumor. Do you want to sleep in these fields for the rest of your life? For my family's peace of mind, I must find out who these men were. Did they have any accomplices? I'm willing to pay you double to find out. To start with, there's that strange plant they were carrying around. Yes, I would start there. I've never seen anything like it in Gosenberg. She sends us out to speak to the trackers about the strange tuber, believing that they might have some information for us. Now, the trackers are down in the southwest portion of the province. They're also going to give you a starter quest for the hunt of the, uh, the phantom hunt here in the region. And they're also going to have a unique shop for us. So let's head off over there. Past where the road ends, we can find the Trekkers Camp. They have a very picturesque location here. You gotta hand it to the Trekkers that they find beautiful locations. Speaking to Trekker Nevin here. No one is safe from the Phantom Swarm, not even in the most sheltered regions. Ask about the strange tuber. I'm surprised you're asking about this plant. Why would you be so surprised? It is a weed that only grows in Alazar. It is not sold anywhere, nor is it edible. Even the pigs won't eat it. But it is nonetheless an astonishing plant. It can survive and thrive in the driest soils. It can spread its roots far and wide to absorb any moisture in the ground. Of course, this means that the surrounding plants quickly wither. I hope this is helpful. So, this shows that somebody from Alazar is trying to sabotage the vineyards of Gosenberg. 
Noises can be heard from outside the camp and the other trackers have vanished. Here we are. Battle is joined. Halt. Who goes there? What do you want? Let us through, tracker. We're here for the mercenaries. Some merchants saw them entering the camp. What do you want from them? Nothing that concerns you, monster hunter. Stand aside, or... Hey, look, who's deciding to join us? Hello, mercenaries. Scram, tracker. This is between the mercenaries and us. Valdius, the captain of unknown soldiers. Level 5, foot soldiers, failing soldiers, lieutenant, and the trackers are sticking up for us now. We did become a member of the tracker order down in Tiltran. They're ready to stand beside their own. Helping us out in the battle is the Master Tracker with his hatchet, it looks like. He looks like a, a stalwart ally. Definitely want to keep him safe. And then we have a nondescript warrior here. Now, the Tracker who was filling in the role of shopkeeper was also gone from the location. So that may be the warrior. We're going to try and keep them safe nonetheless. Normally, I'm fine sacrificing my allies so that I can keep my own units healthy. But uh, in this case... I, I do like the trackers. Don't want them taking any unnecessary damage on our part. <laughs> hey, the master tracker does the final blow. He was not, he was not a great ally, but <laughs> he finished things off for us. I wonder why these men were so keen to find you. Why kill for a simple tuber? Uh, it is a larger plot that we have been unraveling. While we're here at the tracker camp, let's go ahead and pick up the hunt for the region. There we are, Vitrus Hunt. The report The report mentions a half-eaten corpse south of Rutebrun Cave. It, if, it, if it is indeed the Phantom Pack, we will have to wait until nightfall before going after it. Should probably improve your uh, your shield there, my friend. Hunter Cassadan, what do you have for us? So the usual offering, we've got a little bit of food, rewards from their previous hunt. We've got traps that we can get. I don't really love traps because these other pieces are so, so valuable. Though we have enough teeth, we could go ahead and indulge in some of the trapping as well. We're going to be able to purchase all of these and break down what all these new plans do. We've got the Hunter's Reinforced Layer and the Tracker's Reinforced Layer. Both of these are craftable out of your Blacksmith. We get Guard plus 3%, so this is going to be the damage reduction that you receive while your armor still has durability. Increasing that Guard could lead to some very, very tanky characters, so that's a really interesting piece to have. And then the Hunter's Reinforced Layer for your Archers, for your Rogues or your, um, your Rangers, being able to increase their Dexterity by 2%. Two, this is really going to amp up your damage dealers if you want to turn them into glass cannons. Flipping over to the Tinkerer, we have quality projectiles. So this is going to be a belt accessory, giving us damage of precision attacks increased by 10%. And then we also have the Trekker's Charm increasing. It's giving you terror resistance. So this is only useful for fighting the phantom swarm. They apply stacks of terror to your characters. If you hit five, then your character automatically flees the battle. If they are wearing this belt accessory, they will be able to withstand up to six stacks of terror. I don't find either of these to be as interesting as the armor layers that we unlock out of this same shop, though the quality projectiles does unlock a further level once we craft it. So let's go ahead and do that and see what the improved version would provide us feels like we should be able to make camp within the trackers camp just like you're able to make camp in town and you get that kind of extra town zone it seems like the trackers would allow us to just stay in their camp so we're going over to the tinkerer and we're going to slide down belt accessories quality projectiles here we go Crafting the quality projectiles teaches you Ballast Stone, giving you precision plus 10%. So this is going to be the accuracy of your attacks, able to hone in on their intended target. You have a chance of hitting any other uh, character's enemy or friend on the same path to the target that you pick from your archers. So if you have the Ballast Stone, you'll be able to have that extra stack of reliability on hitting your intended target. Now that we have had that detour with the trackers, we need to return to the Loop Vineyard to be able to actually cash out our progress on this portion of the story quest. 
When we return to the Loop Vineyard, it is still thriving, and we're able to relay the information we have learned about the tubers from the trackers. The owner of the vineyard then heads off to speak with the broker, I believe, in his castle. There we go, Marham Castle, and says that we may be sent for at any time. I believe the time will be precisely when there is one mission left to complete in the fate of her truce. Right here at Johan Mullen's Vineyard, which is just across the river from the main city, you hop in and you get a snippet of conversation of these four men huddled around the table, speaking about how something must be done to stop the vineyards being poisoned. They believe that the companions are protecting the abbey and they see the abbey as the villains here. So, did you hear everything we said? Good. At least you know what you're getting yourselves into. Fighting the companions is not for the faint of heart. And he will give us 200 crowns, along with progress in the fate of her troops. Then the men disappear, so there is not much that is available here to be able to be gained besides from the quest beginning. But now, we are off to the Abbey. Help the Vinters enter St. Leonard's Abbey. And actually, there is the band ahead of us, so maybe we should speed up and catch up with them. As we approach the Abbey, which is just north of Brown Rock Town, and you'll get the indicator on your map to be able to guide you here if you choose to divert and do another quest along the way, we get the conversation between the Vinters and the Companions. Now, the Abbey is being used as a haven and a hospital for plague-ridden individuals. They are given health care, and they are, I believe, healed eventually i don't know exactly what is going on but if you go in there you're able to see a number of plague ridden are kept there and praying at the altar and the venters believe that the plague ridden are actually causing their fields to wither so now we are on the side of the venters up against the companions so we have our friends johan and this civilian but uh, i don't think they are going to be pulling very much weight in this battle this is the companion captain. She has her own stats buffed up, but is not providing a bonus to the rest of the team. She does have this team strike ability. Oof. That looks very dangerous. I will say that while these story missions do not offer the hardest combat encounters in the game, these ones are definitely a step up from what you will face in Tiltran, the home region. So you're going to want to be on your A game when you are tackling these missions, though <laughs> here they have so many units just bunched up on each other, the uh, companions are getting stuck and not able to actually assist each other. Besting the companions gives us entry into the abbey, and here we have the abbot and uh, Johan, Yehan, squaring off. We have the plague ridden are over here. They're not going to kill us, are they? And then you have the rest of the Vinters. We came all the way here, we will not be intimidated. Out of the way, Abbot, we demand justice. You slaughtered our defenders, forced your way into an abbey, and now you threaten to kill innocent people. How dare you speak of justice? So the Abbot tries to talk sense to the Vinters. Unsuccessfully, they believe the Plague Ridden have to be killed in order for there to be uh, peace and health in their vineyards. So we now need to talk them out of it ourselves because we know that it happens to be a, another mercenary group operating and spreading those strange tubers that is actually causing it and has nothing to do with the Plague Ridden. Here you can select the abbot, and you can execute the plague ridden, being able to get the reward promised by the Vinters, or you can head over to uh, Johan, and you can either try to persuade them using your influence to be able to gain a lesser reward, or you can go in and attack, being able to pick up a new belt accessory, and in addition to the other uh, rewards that are promised out of persuading them. If you do choose to fight the Vinters, then the battle is fairly easy and the extra belt accessory that you pick up will reduce the amount of terror applied to the companion every turn by one. So this is going to be useful for fighting the Phantom Hunt, though I've not had too much trouble balancing out the stacks of terror that my companions receive. Maybe in new regions or at higher levels, this will become more useful, but that's what you are getting or what you are passing up if you choose to simply persuade them with your influence and talk them out of the fight. Ah, very interesting. So, even though the reward of the belt accessory is not listed, if you choose to persuade the Venters to stand down, you can still talk to the Abbot and be able to pick it up, which is very cool to see, actually. 
Now our final mission takes us to the Broker's Castle, and oh my gosh, so many boars, come on. Just make it to the castle gates. Here we go, and pulling up the map, we are right here, again, just north across the river from the main town. You have to cross by the bridge to be able to get here, and you are going to have the purple indicator to show you where you need to go. We can speak with Clemens to be able to continue the quest. Rosa Loop told me of your discovery. If I didn't trust her, I wouldn't believe a word of this tale. And so that is the owner of the vineyard that we had helped out. Okay, he is promising us a hundred crowns and the completion of the fate of Vertrus for going out and doing some weeding in the fields. Amazing. So we learn weeding potion teaches you how to prepare the weeding potion. And we're actually going to have to use up our salt and Gozenberg wine to be able to make this. Pour this onto a plant. This potion will burn it from root to leaf. That makes me question slightly what they have been putting in their wine this whole time. Now the map will helpfully point out the location of the three vineyards that require weeding. So we are going to head out to the very first one here and see if we can fully exterminate this strange tuber. So there's going to be multiple strange tubers that are out that you can interact with and actually pick up into your inventory. And then it looks like there's going to be a central one that you can pour the weeding potion onto. So we're going to go ahead and use our weeding potion. And here comes a band of enemies. What did you pour on that plant? Why is it wilting so quickly? Well, my friend, it seems that your plot has been unraveled. I found the key with being able to make it through these battles is eliminating the lieutenants who are going to be bringing in the big hammers. Those hammers are going to apply the bleed status effect and that is honestly what's going to chew through your guys faster than any of the other damage that they are going to be put out unless you are low level or uh, are just kind of piecing your band together. The other enemies, the foot soldiers here, are tanky, but they're not too dangerous themselves. And then the failing soldiers are bad if they gang up on your units, but if you just engage them one to one, then you usually come out winning anyway. With those enemies dealt with, the tubers are gone. We're not going to see the fields revitalize quite yet, but now we are able to go on to the next vineyard. We will, however, have to keep on crafting more of that weed killing potion, uh, which is going to tax our, where is it, the Gozenberg wine and some of our other ingredients. With two more potions in inventory, it's time to find, ah, uh, here it is. We are at Johann's Vineyard and we have found the, the queen tuber. Pour on the weeding potion. Will we be attacked again? Of course we will. These dried up twigs. Is that all that's left of the tuber? By Saint Septimus Skull, our lady will not be pleased. Now at our third and final vineyard to be fully weeded. Put on the weeding potion. Will this combat be unique or will this be the same as all the others? What's this, mercenaries? I didn't know you enjoyed gardening. With the final combat dealt with, we are approached by a Metalberth Loop. Now that's what I call a fight, mercenaries. Those gladiators have got nothing on you. Don't think I only came here to admire your skills. The broker asked me to tell the Vinters you were headed this way so that they wouldn't mistake you for the ones you are after. The broker also asked me to give you your reward once you've finished. Something about Lady Brunhilde has him very preoccupied and he has a no time for visitors at the castle. There we are, we have gained 100 crowns, and now I do believe if we go back to the castle, we may be able to embark upon the fate of Vertrus, the final storyline for the region. If this video has helped you guys out, then show some support, throw down a like, and if you want to see more of my guides that I'm going to be turning out here for War Tales, subscribe to make sure you get to see those videos right when they come out. If you wait for about a day, the broker will send for you at his castle, so we return to the castle to speak with Clemens. I asked you here, mercenaries, as I cannot entrust the guard nor the companions with this mission. Arresting an Alazarian princess is both dangerous and unheard of. Everything you learn from the trackers Rosal Joran points to Brunhilde. She poisoned Vertrus in a bid to make me pay dearly for the remedy. 
Corrine's abduction is the key to this whole mess. With her gone, I am free to wed another woman, Brunhilde's daughter, under the law of all-seeing eye. Uniting Vertrus and Alizar is the first step to fulfilling their dream of restoring the Northern Kingdom. You must bring them back to reality. My men have surrounded Brunhilde Alzar's manor, but I need your help to apprehend her. Our next quest marker is on the Alizar Manor all the way across the region. Let me know in the comments if you guys think the whole political intrigue and plan here makes any sense. Now just past Brown Rock, we come to the manor and we see a group of companions, it looks like, are directly outside, or are these the uh, broker's men? We won't get in the way. The broker asked us to let you arrest this woman. Our rule is only to stop her until your arrival. Why why can't you guys just arrest her? If the whole point is that he can't trust the guards to actually do it, why would he trust them to guard her? Well, here she is. She's not looking as good as she used to. How ironic. The Clemens send my own accomplices to arrest me. I don't suppose you mentioned abducting his fiancée. Ah, of course you didn't. You were going to slaughter Clemens' men and let me go. Why are you going to do this, do you ask? Because you need me to escape, of course. I am taking Corrine with me, along with any evidence linking you to me. No one will ever know of your actions here. And if that doesn't convince you to bend the rules, I am offering you a reward and giving you access to Alazar. So, what do you say? So now we get to decide if we are truly going to arrest her or if we are going to follow her plan, allowing her to escape and keep her from incriminating us in our side of the political intrigue that has been going on. Now, Elazar is not actually in the game at this stage of early access, so the border pass is not adding anything to our reward. I think that we are going to stay on the side of the broker and a follow through here, battling unknown soldiers level 6, so they are the agents of Brunhilde. So Brunhilde herself is nothing special, but her personal guards here leveled up to level 6 when currently our party's max is 5, and so the way the game scales difficulty of your opponents is based on your party's average level, and then it decides on if it needs it to be an easy encounter, moderate encounter, or a super challenging encounter. And so this is labeled as extremely challenging for at least the way the game is processing things, and uh, I'm not looking forward to this fight. I take it all back that these story missions... <laughs> We're going easy on us. My goal here is to try and fight the enemies in stages, leaving the enemies in this corner and this corner, hopefully wasting a few turns being able to close the distance with me. Now, these guys are pretty close. We're going to have to try and uh, retreat our units from their reach. Let's see, how feasible is that? It looks like it's actually pretty feasible. As long as we move stab and knife out of the way, then uh, none of these guys should be able to get in range. As a wrinkle here, I do believe that we have to capture Brunhilde alive, and it is not giving us the instant capture ability that we had unlocked in her capture mission, where we kidnapped the uh, broker's fiance. Things have actually gone fairly well for us. We're winning out on this corner of the map. We had the enemies really get stuck up on each other, coming around this flank to be able to help out, and we are winning in the center. So everything is coming up for our band. We're going to go ahead and push this guy back so that he falls within the range of the assistance from his brother. I love it. Stab and jab. What a duo. We're going to go ahead and apply the bleeding because these foot soldiers are very tanky. Let's see if we can go for the capture on Brunhilde here. We're able to get in there with the torch. And okay, so... Do we have to eliminate her? This is then just gonna like, story takes over and she's captured at the end of this? I, uh, I, I hope so. Ah, would you look at that. When you only fight half of the level six enemies at once, the encounter's not so bad. Oh yes, but we do get level six armor drops from it. Ah, oh, that is so good. And now on the body, we are able to loot the golden key. Now we already had a copy of the golden key to be able to find the um, the alchemist down with the uh, bandit lair, but apparently she also had a key. Ah, here it is, here it is. There is the chest right here in the corner where we can use the golden key and we can find Corrine, who is trapped in the chest. You, you abducted me. 
I will have you hung as soon as... You killed Brunhilde Alhazar to free me? But weren't you following her orders? I am confused. I just want to get out of here. I don't blame you. Have you arrested Brunhilde? Oh, she's dead. Having to deal with the diplomatic consequences of this death will not sit well with the Broker Council. That being said, Alazar's interference in our affairs cannot remain unpunished. As for me, I am in your debt. Thanks to you, I once again rule over a prosperous province and am betrothed to a maiden I trust entirely. I thought he just said he didn't want to marry her, that her being gone allowed him to marry somebody else. Please accept this reward, which I hope is fair compensation for your efforts. Rest assured, you will always be welcome in Vertruce. 250 crowns and 50 influence. You have finished the Vertruce scenario. It is time to explore other regions, but no, no, no. There is a much more that we can find here in Vertruce. Vertruce has a ton of really awesome, unique combat encounters. Of course, we have the bandits centered at their lair over here with minor lairs down at the Sentinel Tower and the Flooded Mine. Make sure that you have grabbed up the bounties because they will often be available to hunt down the bandits in these different locations. And then we also have the Hunter's Quest tracking down the Phantom Swarm, which is pretty standard across all the regions that you're going to be able to find those kind of situations. But here we also have have Smots Arena and fighting Colonel Alexa as the champion encounters that we have. Let's head straight off to the arena because I think that is one of the most intriguing opportunities this region has for us. Coming up here to Smots, if we pull up the map, it is just north following the road from the castle. We can enter into the arena and let's see what is available to us. Gilius here is a shopkeeper, but he is only going to sell to arena champions. I wonder how elite a group that really is. And here we get welcome to the local arena. You can register up to four fighters. You are not allowed to kill your opponent, but no holds are barred. Let's dive right in. Round one. Rules. A team consists of four fighters. After registering, the team cannot be modified for the rest of the competition. Number two, we fight three battles in a row to take on the arena champion and try to obtain their medal. Number three, when a fighter has no more health, they do not die but are instantly taken out of combat and hopefully given medical treatment. The special rule of the arena is that clouds of poison appear under all the units at the end of each turn. Oh, oh. bring your first aid. We are going to have to cut our elite team of eight down to just four. Let's see who makes the cut. Okay, here's our four and my reasoning behind picking these characters. So we're bringing in Jab as a pikeman. He's also got first aid to be able to cleanse off any of the status effects, bleed effects, poison, be able to keep the team topped up and healthy rather than being whittled away by the status effects. He is also the one with phalanx strike, so I find that really useful being able to contain the enemy units, and he gains valor points just standing next to friends, so really easy valor point generation. Axe is our Berserker. I think the Berserker class is insane. He just dishes out so much damage. So we are bringing in him. Tough is our tank. She'll be able to take on groups of enemies, hold them off. She also has a weakening blow. So if the enemies are running a glass cannon, who's really going to be able to one shot characters, she can tone that damage down to moderate levels. And then it was really close between Twang and Knife as another kind of damage dealer support unit. We're going with the archer here. He is equipped with the small gauntlet, increasing his base damage by 50%. It means that he can't use any of his valor abilities, but he's got an insane bow. His tricked out with the, um, dexterity increase on his armor and with the small gauntlet he can put out some insane damage i felt like his damage overall was just a little bit higher than knife though knife is bringing in the poison status effect it's close it's close we're gonna lock it in and now we begin requirements sarelna must take damage reward two valor points this unit is part of the crowd's requirements all right so we have sarelna and Surlenal. I think they were just playing anagrams with the names here. Uh, but they are both rogues bringing the same thing. They have the stab right between the eyes. Man, I want this dagger. Inflicts 17 to 22 damage and applies bleeding. Guaranteed bleeding is so good. And if the target is already bleeding, then the damage is doubled. Please, oh please give me this dagger. 
Now, thankfully, if they are engaged already, they will not be able to use the attack, though their counter move here is blind, allowing them to simply disengage. So if we can bog them down, they will not be able to apply the bleed status effect. Their warrior over here in the corner has Overbearing Strike, deals 12 to 17 damage to the target. The damage is doubled if the target's health is higher, I suppose, than hers. Is that going to be a problem? Uh, only for Axe. And then we also have Boarding. Okay, so this is, I believe that's for uh, nautical combat. So they do damage to the target and lures them into close range to engage them. Oh, that's so cool. Ah, also has increased damage against targets with full health. The rogues have Ordeal, so every time they strike a target that has a negative status effect applied or a damage over time status effect to be specific, they will get a stack of Fever, increasing the damage they take by 10%. And finally, the leader here is using Thunderous Blow. If engaged in combat with an ally, this skill forces them to disengage, and the ally inflicts an attack of opportunity. Really good stuff there. Shield Slam. Does damage to the target and applies fragility, meaning damage taken is increased by 30% for one round, and they have head bash. At the end of their turn, the closest target loses 8 health. It's just the closest target, so you can do a ranged head bash? Ah, oh, I hope that is the case. We want to contain their leader here, so we're going to step up a little, use impale to push them to the side, and then we're going to keep on moving across because we want tough here to be able to go in and engage this rogue. Now we want to run tough up to be able to bog down their rogue. We're going to throw out the weakening strike. I don't know if weakening is ever going to apply. There we go. We made the crowd happy. So by attacking her, we're able to gain valor points. We get these extra little challenges to pick up the bonus valor points. Oh, looks like you're going out early, my friend. There it is. Out of combat and she limps away. And we gain fury. Okay, okay. Let's reposition. Ooh, can we reposition out of the poison just a little bit, please? I'm not quite sure if you can, how much you can overlap on these future poison clouds. Let's throw up protection. And here we go. Ah, oh, that stab is just so good. So now he does head bash. Ah ha ha! So head bash is a little misleading. It says just the closest target. I think it's going to be the closest valid target. And so he does actually have to be engaged to be able to use that ability. Hmm, we could come across the warrior is going next. Or, let's see, I really want to engage this rogue. Just to be able to keep the bleeding status effects off of us. Ooh, alright. Working our way through. Round one, I guess, is not supposed to be too terribly challenging. Second opponent down. Things are all coming our way. Here comes the warrior, engaging with Jab, gets that bonus damage because Jab is still at 100% health. Now we want to move in Twang. If we stand next to an ally, we'll be able to get a Valor Point back. And we'll put the damage onto the leader to be able to break his armor. There comes the Poison new requirement, land a critical hit with two different units. Well, I don't know if we'll be able to pull that off, but it's worth three Valor Points, which is pretty great. We also managed to avoid the poison ourselves, but our opponents got poisoned. That is the ideal scenario here. Let's see, I think we just shove her back and then, well, we want to keep on moving because it'll keep on spewing out poison. So we'll double around, throw up the spear wall. There we go. Now it is all in on the leader. Try and engage on the very corner of the gas cloud so hopefully we don't get poisoned. You had a good band, really. You had good things going. I would love to purchase some of your rogue's daggers. No, don't leave. Uh, then we want to be careful about the poison clouds because just moving through the poison clouds will poison you. I'm so used to playing with fire on the battlefield and there you can just run through everything. Okay, so they get stabbed and I think we can just bring things to an end right here. Arm of justice. Come on, Axe. Finish them. Ah, two health. Okay, here we go. Gift from the crowd. Following your victory, the crowd adores you. Choose an upgrade for the rest of the competition. Increased damage from critical hits. Critical damage increased by 30%. 
that's pretty enormous or pressure all the enemies start the battle with vulnerability meaning they will take increased damage i don't think our crit chance is quite high enough to really lean into this it's also just inconsistent it's always better to be able to take things that you can count on when you're planning out the battle here new arena rule plagued rats are unleashed into the arena at the end of each turn oh that is amazing okay this whole user interface is fantastic so we have clouds of poison appearing and plague rats so they just keep on stacking on us here oh it's so good so let's repair the armor and then is it actually repaired there yeah okay so it is repaired and we can hop on in do i want to cash the bravery points i i we got plenty built up we'll we'll wait some units do not have a bonus selected Oh, okay. So yeah, you give me that. You give me that. And you're not able to. I either I can either I can choose one of these. Okay. The interface is making even more sense. So you can either heal the unit, repair the unit's armor, or gain two bravery points. So we're gonna lock in the bravery points across the board and enter into round two. There are poison traps now. Walking close to this trap could trigger it and release a cloud of poison. The enemies are very similarly set up to last time. Two rogues, one warrior, and then the big boss. Though we have two of them that are considered leaders with their stats all buffed up by 30%. We're going to approach things in very much the same way as before. Move up jab. Shove the leader. Put up the spear wall so that'll basically cancel his first turn. And then... We want to throw tough all the way across, mm, but then they would be in the poison. I suppose not if they just finish them in the first strike though, right? Which they are very apt to do when we are guaranteed to crit against the enemy in our first strike against them. That is what the pressure, the enemy team is feeling the pressure. So we are landing all the crits. Also, we don't want Jab to take any damage and we'll be able to gain more Valor points. So we can spend recklessly for now. Oh yes, landing the huge crits out of Tough. I love it. Let's go ahead and throw up protection. Because we know they're going to come swinging back at us at least once. Jab's looking pretty good on being able to survive without taking any damage. So now we move in Axe. Axe should be able to use Arm of Justice to reach out, grab the rogue. Here we go. Get that crit. Oh, oh, oh. So the crit counts for... It's, this, this attack is very interesting. You reach out and grab them, and then you get an attack of opportunity. But I found that whatever bonuses would apply to your initial attack get also applied to the attack of opportunity. So I'm finding that weapon to be incredibly useful. The, uh, the Arm of Justice basic attack. I'm not worried about gaining Valor points right now because, ooh, I guess we could just drop this other opponent. Where is the best point to be able to be in range? Let's go over here. Not trigger that poison trap, please. And thank you. There goes the poison, and here come the Plague Rats. Uh, wonderful. We made the crowd happy, and now Plague Rat must take damage, so we need to uh, kill, I guess, is it specifying which one? Oh yeah, here it is. The little requirement. This unit is part of the crowd's requirement. Do I actually have to kill the rats to make it out of the fight? Or uh, if I down the leader here, is that all that it takes? Well, let's get out of the, uh, the poison cloud that is soon to come. And throw our stab, breaking his armor. Now the rats love the poison, they will actually get healed if they end the turn with the poison status effect. Though they have such little health, it's really just one hit and they're down anyway. Here we go, Bazooka. Take us home, Axe. You're the crowd's favorite for a reason, my man. There's the full compliment coming out of the enemy, even able to get his headbutt off at the very end. Tough, finish him off with wrath. Yeah.
There we go, we don't have to finish the wrath. So, following the victory of the crowd, it was you choose an upgrade for the rest of the competition. We can get improved dexterity or improved strength. We're gonna go with strength because we only have the one character doing damage off of their dexterity. New arena rules, the opposing team starts the battle with a plague-ridden ally. Why would you make... <laughs> Why are you having the poor plague-ridden guy have to take part in the battle? I feel like that's just unfair to him. Once again, we the main decision point here is what we do with Axe, because he was hurt and his armor was damaged uh, because of the poison. So we're going to go with fixing up the armor, because that gives him a lot more effective health than the uh, just healing him would, and everybody else is going to give us our Valor points to top them off. Land a critical hit with two different units to be able to get the adoration of the crowd. Here's the Plague Ridden. They've got Infectious Wound, healing damage and applying a fever. Also, every time this unit engages, it will create a pool of poison around them. So this the arena really loves their poison. And then as Plagued, they will take extra damage from fire and be able to heal from stacks of poison on themselves. Otherwise, we've basically seen this entire enemy team before, though now they are all getting the leader's increase to their strength, dexterity, and health, so they should all be pretty tough to handle. I don't see why we should deviate from what has been a pretty winning formula for us. So, uh, Jab, get in there. Aw, oh, yes, we got that crit. Well, yeah, of course we got the crit. They have vulnerable. <laughs> that is a guarantee now. And our strength is higher, so our damage should be hopefully keeping up with their increased health pool. At least it's only their health, and not also their armor, right? Yeah, it's increasing their constitution, which is only health, not armor. Uh, at first I was like, I don't know if I could fulfill the crowd's requirement of getting the crits. Well, it's pretty easy to fulfill the crowd's requirement of getting the crits when you guaranteed critting the enemies for the first time that you strike them. So, uh, there we go. Let's see, do we actually want to back tough up? I think we do. Yeah, we'll pull back a little bit. And here come the other enemies. Ooh, they got the knife throw. What is this? They actually have different skill sets? Oh, why would you step on that trap? Why would you do that? Oh, okay, so right between the eyes is actually a ranged attack. So I knew that. It's the same attack that I've seen before, but it is a range attack. And so there we go. We've got units who are both poisoned and bleeding now. Wonderful. Axe is the last to go. Uh, there we go. What do I want you to do? <laughs> do you run into the poison to engage with them? Or... I mean, that seems like what we're doing here. Yeah, we'll do it. I don't love it. Though, we should be able to get through them pretty quick. Just like that. Alright, out of combat. Wonderful. He's got the bonus. Um, what is it? Recklessness. So his first attack is going to do an extra 150% damage, which is then stacking on top of being guaranteed to crit. So his opening swing is just insane. And here come the Plague Rats. Oh, I almost forgot about those guys. Thankfully, they'll attack anybody. New requirement. Plague, plague ridden must take damage. Well, yeah, I kind of, kind of want to take them out. Okay, so we want to be careful here with uh, jab. We want to go for the heal onto somebody just to keep the stacks of poison down because we're fighting in these poison clouds. The the damage is sure to stack up very quickly. So let's get out of here. And then let's knock him back. Uh, I was kind of hoping they would actually go into the trap there. That would have been amazing. Put up the phalanx wall. And the poison is eating through us. There we go. Damage onto the plague ridden. That's good. We get the extra valor points from the adorations of the crowd. And let's see. What's the next play? Do we bring in the archer? I think it's with the archer. Maybe he doesn't even move. Maybe he just goes for uh, this attack. Yeah, okay, so we're down to one enemy, though I may have to be able to eliminate the Plague Ridden as well, though. I didn't have to eliminate the Plague Rats. This just feels so bad, because here at the Abbey, they take care of the Plague Ridden, and now they have this guy fighting in the arena, like, 
You really drew this short stick on life. Okay, Axe, take us home if uh, just eliminating the enemy team does get us out of combat. Two crits, fantastic. Pinwheel that axe. Yes. Now use your wrath. Strike out in your anger. Out of combat. Do we have to eliminate the Plague Ridden as well? We do not. They're just there to help out. You don't actually have to finish them. Well, good. We send him to the Abbey, please. Our final gift. Die. The death of an enemy generates a valor point or crazed crowd. Fulfilling a requirement grants an additional two valor points. We're going to go for uh, die. So far, we've not had an issue topping up our valor points. So we're going to go for that. We're going to repair the armor over here. Sadly, the, uh, the health is severely weakened, but we're still going to go for topping up the armor. Even though it's about the same level, the armor has the guard value. So being able to increase the armor is going to give you a higher effective health pool than increasing the same amount of health, if that makes sense. Let's see. Yeah, Twang, you can just give us the top up on Valor points, and then over here, Tough, you want the last little bit increased on your armor. Oh, I love the minigame of managing the arena team here. There are no extra special rules added in. We're just fighting the champion. Defeat the arena champion to obtain their medal. I wonder if any of these special rules will even apply at all. Here we go. Take on the champion. New requirement. Smot must take the... Ah, oh, the arena is named after Smot. And here they are. Okay. 275 armor. 215 health. Toxic blade deals 21 damage to the target. Consumes all poisons applied to increase the damage by 15% per application. So, poisoned enemies are going to be vanquished very quickly. And then we have Rat Master. For every three allied rats killed, this unit gains Berserk for one turn. And Berserk means damage and damage taken increased by 100%. And that's plagued allied rats killed. They have the plague ridden here, and then the rats are going to come in every subsequent round. And because poison spawns underneath us, there's going to be poison everywhere, and their blade is going to go insane. Also, because Smot is in the champion class, here, let's pull up their full their full breakdown. Smot's tunic, oh, I wish you could loot this, but usually you can only take the boss's weapon. Yes, Dex 19 and Toxic Blade, that would be so much fun. But yeah, Smot's tunic giving them all that armor, and then they have the champion status. Can't use more than one skill in a given round, so we're going to have to see them intersperse. It looks like they get two turns uh, per round. Not bad. Matthias was able to do a little better, but uh, I'm not going to tell Smot that. <laughs> Alright, let's see what these crits are able to do to their armor value. Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> and we made the crowd happy, yeah. The requirements are pretty easy when you just say Smot must take damage. Every little bit helps here. And there we go. Now, I'm going to swing in with Tough here to be able to apply Weakening Blow just to try to tone down the what that dagger can do and keep on working on the armor. Tough is able to have an extra 25% damage inflicted to armor because of Armor Breaker class, and then Pound with the weapon is also giving bonus damage against armor. So, ideal for being able to cut through that enormous effective health pool. Twang, you can slide up right behind... Use your bow. Their armor only has 10% guard, so their effective health pool is not crazy. The Plague Ridden coming in, that'll be a stack of fever. Oh, and poison. No! That is my character with first aid. Okay, so we've got to push them back, and then, uh, what are we doing over here? I guess we're moving to the side. I wish we could apply first aid to ourselves, but you can't do that. We will throw up the phalanx wall so that if they move forward, we'll stop them in their tracks. Right now, the poison is only giving us three damage a turn, so that's not too bad. Mm, okay, the crowd wants us to engage the plague ridden. I do not want to engage the plague ridden. So, <laughs> we'll see if we can avoid that, if at all possible. Now, I want to use tough right now because Smot still has that tiny bit of armor. And we get the bonus damage as long as they have armor. So we're going to go ahead, roll into here. 
keep on spending our valor points. And then reposition to be able to get out of the poison as long as possible. So we'll slide up here. All right, Twang, show me a big crit. Big crit. 40, 42 damage was not quite what I was looking for, but it's what we got. And there goes the stab back into Axe. Axe is still doing fine. All right, pinwheel that, pinwheel that hatchet. Cut him down to size. We got a crit in there. I love it. Arm of Justice. We don't get the bonus attack because we're already engaged. Wrath takes us even closer. Ooh, Smot's going down. The crowd can feel it. The crowd can feel it. Plague Rat goes out. All right, Jab. Time to bring you around. Standing next to an ally gives us brutality. Increase to our damage. And Smot goes down. Congratulations, you are now the reigning champions of the arena. As the rules dictate, you can walk away with the weapon of the previous champion, Smot. We gain Viper, her named dagger. And that's not all, here's the official arena medal. It may attest to your achievement. Collect the medals for all the combat arenas to earn the right to participate in the grand tournament. Oh, I am looking forward to that in the full game. And now Gilius here is going to provide us his wares. Oh, he has so many awesome, unique things here. Well, we are very well off, so let's go ahead and buy all of these recipes and see what they have for us. We have learned Antidote, prepared by renowned apothecary. This lotion protects against the worst poisons. This unit has a 50% chance to resist applications of poison. I think a really clever usage of this could be even putting it on your own ranger if you are going down. Let's here. Let's pull up knife and show it off. Yeah, over here. If you're going down the poisoner route of your own ranger, you have the poison vial so you can throw out in an area of effect three stacks of poison. Being able to potentially resist your own applications of poison opens up your options of when you are throwing it out. Because once you're engaged, you have to target the person right in front of you and then you're going to be poisoning yourself. But there could be an opportunity to do splash poison damage to a lot of enemies all around you. It's, it's pretty niche, but it is nice to see. We also have a training dummy over here for the Tinkerer. Assigned companions earn some experience during a rest and a troop bonus experience gained in combat increased by 5%. So if you are feeling under leveled or you want to rush down to be able to get some cool new skills, you're able to put this into camp, assign people to it, and you'll be able to level them up much faster. Then we have a blinding powder. It's gonna go in your offhand slot, so where your throwing knife or your torch usually goes. Blinding powder, you have the blind capability and it will instantly disengage you from whoever you're engaged with. Now it does cost a valor point, so I, I don't know if it's really worth it, but it again, <laughs> A lot of this stuff is just really good for your rangers. Being able to keep them disengaged from opponents synergizes with a lot of their kit. Then we have the poisoned throwing knife. Oh, stacking on the poison, even more toys for our ranger. Though, honestly, you could put this on another character if you want to be generating poison from another character and be able to get some more synergy going around, especially if you want to use Viper, who is going to consume those stacks of poison. It doesn't do a lot of damage, it's ranged, and it's going in the offhand, so it's competing with Blinding Powder for a slot, but it applies one stack of poison. All of these poison opportunities is going to synergize with Poison Mastery, so I highly recommend taking this. If you're going down the poison route, you're going to be able to get even more damage over time, more percentage damage off of your poison if you grab that up. And if you choose to invest in, I guess I can show it in the compendium, if we go over to the Apothecary table. You can find the poison vial, so after using a skill, every single skill that does damage, you have a 30% chance to poison the target. So if you're going down the poisoner route, putting, putting the poison vial on them to get even more stacks, so you could use your poison knife and then have a 30% chance of being able to stack on more damage there. And then you have the poison throwing dagger, which I guess technically you would have to use first. You would get even more stacks, and then if you're using the poison bomb that would apply three stacks, you get another chance to apply additional poison. It gets, it gets out of hand very quickly. Another option for the poison build is to get the poison oil, 
which means that every time a skill deals damage, it has a 20% chance to apply one poison. And you might think that that's just worse than using the belt accessory that's giving you the 30% chance, but you can concentrate the poison oil on the weapon to be able, in, with a belt accessory right here, poisonous oil concentrate, that will increase the effect up to 30%. So then you're getting 50% chance when a skill deals damage to add a stack of poison. So you've got your options on how you want to build out your characters here if you're going heavily invested into the poison poison path. Now, if all those rewards didn't seem good enough, he is also offering skill mastery tomes. We're going to pick up a few of these and show off what they're able to do. This skill mastery book is incredibly powerful and very unique. It promises to allow a character to improve their class skill. So if you go over here, you see their class skills are anything beyond her, uh, level three. That's where you specialize into a class and then anything beyond that should be able to be upgraded. I mean, right now we only have two levels, so not everything is going to be able to be improved, but you have to go back to the other page. And so when you're looking at their skills down here, you now get an option to right click and you'll be able to get the improved version. And it shows you on the screen here with the green arrow what the improvement is going to be. So if we choose to upgrade spear throw, normally it will only apply bleeding to the first enemy hit. Now, if we upgrade it, I should say, it will apply bleeding to every enemy hit, which is amazing. Just point and click bleed on a range attack. So, so good. And similarly, if we upgrade Fervent Support, now this is a passive, and what it is is if an enemy attacks an ally that is adjacent to stab, he will reach over and get an attack of retribution in there. Right now he does 14 damage. It's based on his strength. If we upgrade it, he'll be doing 22 damage. That's a pretty significant improvement. Oh, there are so many really juicy upgrades. I don't want to go through all of them and spoil what they all are. I'm probably going to do class guides in their own videos, and then we'll break down the upgrades for all the abilities. But suffice to say, these books are well worth their price. That being said, I'm going to gobble up all of these. Thank you, Gilius. Thank you very much. If we return to Clemens after having freed his bride, Corrine, we we're able to get a little bit of extra extra dialogue out of him. It is an honor to welcome Vitrus's heroes to my castle. And that's all you get. But Corrine's here and you can talk to her as well. I'm still cross with you, you know, for abducting me. That's very fair. When Clemens said he intended to name our firstborn after you, I refused categorically. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, you should definitely refuse. Let's see, who is who is our captain again? It's Captain Jab. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a name worth passing on. While I no longer wish to see you hung, there is only so much I can take. All right, all right. I'll, I'll count that as a win. To wrap up our arena experience with a neat little bow, we're going to go to the Vertusian Windmill. This is a right on the road in probably one of the first locations you're going to visit if you go to Vertus. And here we meet a old grizzled gladiator, perhaps the predecessor to Smot. So I hear the arena was a dawdle for you. Ha! In that case, you definitely deserve a small reward for a veteran from a veteran like myself. Learn the assassin specialization requires 200 experience. And with a right click, we can preview the assassin. Aha, so here it is after I was asking to be able to get right between the eyes. Here it is, inflicts damage and applies bleeding. If the target is already bleeding, the damage is doubled. This is a range attack coming out of your, I believe this is gonna be for the ranger. It has to be for the ranger, right? And we even get ordeal every time you attack somebody, you get the stacks of fever. Oh, it's wonderful. You learned the assassin specialization. So now we see we have a fourth level on our rangers. We're able to go down the assassin path. I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this was actually already in the, uh, the demo version. And then they swapped it out, I believe, with strategist. You had assassin and strategist swapped. But now if you pick up a new ranger, you can turn them into the ideal assassin. And you can actually put ordeal on any of your ranger characters because after you specialize, you can pick anything from the row underneath. At least that's the way it is currently set up. Now that we've shown off what Smots Arena has, that was super fun. I am looking forward to when they add in all the other regions and the extra arena fights. I wish we could go back and play even more of those. But now I think it's time to uh, fight off the Colonel over here, the other champion character in the region, and start cleaning up the rest of the map. 
to be able to get to the colonel here. We've seen him before, but we were down along this road here, and there is no way to climb up mountains at this point. Instead, you have to be able to get to a landing point at the top, and then from your inventory, place a python along the cliff's edge. Ah, I selected it. There we go. Right click to place and then you can set it down and along with a rope you will then get a path down to the zone below you. Thank you to everyone in the comments of my previous region guide who helped me figure this out. Now please explain to me how we get these fully laden ponies down a cliffside. Just to be able to show off exactly where we are, the rat infestation is a great marker. If you make it up there, you have a route down. Also, if you're over here next to the brown rock mine, you have another path that will be able to get you down to the kernel. And you're going to need to have another python. Well, I guess technically not. You can go both up or down these once you have placed them. But if you get another one, you can go ahead and create a route down here, down to the stables. And you could get a shortcut around this whole loop if you do that. I just left clicked on the python to be able to use it and we are down here with the colonel. Just like Matthias Lund, they are not going to be aggressive and aggro you. You can engage at your choosing and here she is. The legion spares me the dishonor of being chased down by my own brothers in arms. It's most gracious on the general's part. The usurper finally shows a shred of decency. Unfortunately for you, that will not be enough to make me surrender. So here, a level 7 champion. She is supposed to be way harder than what your party is able to take on. Her stats are going to be through the roof, and we have made sure to grab the quest to bring her down to be able to pad our pockets with a few extra crowns when we drop her. Hopping into battle here, I am very glad that with the Beast Master upgrade on our archer, we should be able to keep our animal companion alive, which we were not able to do while fighting Matthias. So let's look over Colonel Alexa here. She has Matthias's hauberk. So I believe this is just because in early access they're reusing assets. This is the same equipment that Matthias was using. Here we have Splitter. Alexa was deeply affected by the war, so when she forged Splitter, she swore to only ever use it for chopping wood. Yeah, it looks like she forged this with wood chopping in mind. A few days later, she beheaded a Lord of Alazar. Strength plus 35 and slice and dice capacity. She is a champion who can use more than one skill in a given round. She has a loss of control. When this unit has less than 50% health, they gain brutality. Damage increased by 30%, so that's just going to be active for the entire final quarter of the battle. And their basic attack is Slice and Dice. Deals 58 damage to all units in the area. The damage is shared among the units hit who share the same number of Bloodshed applications. And Bloodshed causes the target to lose one health per application at the end of their turn. It is stackable and it is removed at the end of their turn if they received no additional applications. So we're going to see exactly how this plays out as we dig into this battle. And there's a look at the zone. It looks about as big as Matthias is able to do, but uh, there's no turn delay on this one, so we're going to have to be careful. We are probably going to be taking a lot of damage, so time to get tough in here. Be able to start battering down that armor and also applying Weakening Blow, which is going to reduce that insane damage from the axe by half. Now, unlike Matthias, you actually can engage Alexa, so you can have her bogged down in combat to guarantee who she is going to be striking, because she has to target the character she's engaged with with Slice and Dice, even though it's a large area of effect, and she might be able to fit more targets if she had moved it. As long as she's engaged, you can guarantee that she's swinging from this side, so then you can bring in your other units from behind to try and make the most of uh, her potential vulnerability. Here comes a knife. Let's see how many stacks of poison we're going to be able to get going. Ooh, we didn't score any right there, which is unfortunate. And there is one stack. Okay, great. Uh, I took the uh, the poison vial accessory off of him, so Frenzy doesn't use the uh, poison status of the knife to be able to give you any extra bonus. Let's see. Now let's use Stab. We can go in with Impale to be able to get a little bit of damage that breaks up the engagement, but then we are able to use impale to add bleeding to them and we can slide off here we don't quite get the spear throw that's fine that's fine oh there it is probably should have kept them engaged 
so that they weren't able to hit all three. And we got 10 stacks of bloodshed. Oof. Alright, Axe. Show her that uh, your axe is pretty fancy too. Get the attack of opportunity. Pinwheel with the rampage. Get the extra stack of fury in there. Very nice. Now I'm going to go ahead and move Jab in. I'm going to be careful because I actually don't want to break up this time when she is engaged. Standing next to the allies gives us uh, brutality for the extra damage. And then we'll galvanize the troops to pick up the, um, the, extra, the extra valor points immediately turn around into first aid here to be able to cleanse off the stacks of bloodshed because that seems to be how she really is going to stack up her damage against us. And go ahead and pass there. Now we can bring in Hatchet. Does he fit? No, he doesn't fit that way. Dang it. Not my uh, cleanest execution here, but if we bring Hatchet in, he'll be able to use Obliteration. Oh, no, no, no. Ah, because she is poisoned, he's guaranteed to crit, and if he crits, he knocks her back. Okay, we'll just we'll just pass Hatch's turn, and we'll let her take her turn. She swings in against Axe and adds 30 stacks of bloodshed. Interesting, so it seems like her damage converts into units of bloodshed. She puts out 30 units every time. She got 10, 10, 10, and here she got 29. Time to run up with Twang to whittle her down. Big crit. 73, that's what I'm talking about. All right, fall back a little bit. And then, Snipe, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for me? Because you put out a burning area. Snipe's basically going to be just a... Uh, <laughs> uh, just going to be a Valor Point generating bot. But we're full of Valor Points right now. Great. Um, I suppose we can run them around to be useful for first aid. That's about it. And the wolf. Make sure we position around the bear trap. Don't want to take any damage that we don't have to. Move in. Be able to get this nine damage. Thank you, Wolfie. Thank you so much. All right, she goes again. Ooh, that still hits wolf? No! Now Axe is up to 44 stacks of bloodshed. Thankfully, she has fragility. This is being applied off of our ranger knife. Can we dive on her and expect to kill her this round? Or do we need to change which target she is focused on? Who would be able to... Who has taunt? I believe it's Hatchet. Yes, it is only Hatchet right now. Okay, that's fine. Or, I, I mean, we could push her back with a um, with one of our pole arms. Maybe we do that. Be able to switch up who is doing the combat here. Um, I want to use Jab if I can. I can Excellent. So we swing all the way around. We can use first aid to be able to clear the uh, bloodshed stacks off of Axe. And then we can use Impale to break up this engagement. Very nice. Uh, let's go back and have you fight tough. Yeah, I like that. Weakening blow. It's already applied, but it's a way that we get a little bit of extra damage. And then we keep on just laying into her down to 211 health. Yeah, it's a big health pool to whittle through. Okay, knife. You are getting the ambush here, so we get the three strikes. So good. Apply a little bit more poison for me. Brilliant. There's the extra bloodshed stacks onto tough. But it looks like Colonel Alexa is going down, going down fast. Big crit, come on, 55, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Step back a little bit, keep our valor points high. 74 health, does Axe bring it home? I don't think Axe actually brings it home yet. <laughs> We got uh, one more turn we want to splice in here. So Stab is gonna use Impale. And then, honestly, we can go for the Tactical Order onto Tough. There it is. Drops the Colonel. Very fun fight. And we are rewarded with Splitter. Ooh, I feel like 
I feel like I have to start using that. Strength plus 35? I mean, I said that Axe had a... <laughs> had a weapon that was pretty cool too, but strength is only plus 7. When we go up to here, now we're talking. Oh my gosh, Rampage is going to do 60 damage. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And Slice and Dice is going to do 50 damage along with applying bloodshed just like the just like the champion does we've just turned axe into the colonel basically with this one weapon now the question is does hatchet switch i don't think hatchet switches he's got obliteration he's got cutting maelstorm i could give the weapon over to him but i feel like hmm i feel like it was time that axe got an upgrade all right, now I found out something very interesting about this zone, and that is that Brown Rock Town and Marham, their emissaries, do not technically share quests. They have their own unique set of quests, so you can pick up duplicates of the same mission. And so you see here we have 560 in rewards because both of them had a mission to bring down the colonel. So you can find some really insane quest rewards if you finagle things by finding the duplicates in Brown Rock Town and Marham. Of course, you have to travel back and forth to be able to pick them up. I don't know if it's worth it to really try, but because fighting the Colonel is pretty much guaranteed to be there, that is one that you can get that double caching on. Unfortunately, it doesn't say what quests here to be able to illustrate what I did, but uh, that, is, that is what I did. Picked it up at both locations. And then we're actually able to inspect over here in the corner their little camp. So we get an extra secret here. This is the Colonel's camp. We gain a skill mastery book. So this is the exact same that you find at the arena. We've now got a stack of 11 waiting for when I do my, uh, my character class guides. I love it. We're gonna start filling in the rest of the encounters just based on being next to each other in the map. So right next to where we fight the Colonel, we have the Stables and then Brown Rock Mine. We're gonna pick up the Village Idiots and then follow along to Grottle Hunting. So here at the Stables, you are able to purchase more horses. You are of course able to buy ponies here and these are more expensive than they are down in Tiltran. I'm actually not sure, maybe it's that they get more expensive the more ponies you already have. Let me know in the comments how that works. Speaking to the owners of the stable, we find that their stable boys are missing and they believe that they are up at Brown Rock Mine. And here, Tall Tale the Minstrel says that he has been telling them a specific story of the Grotel, a beast that hides in the mountains and plays nasty tricks on farmers and the boys really seem to enjoy it. So to be able to track down these stable boys, we're gonna head back up to the Brown Rock Mine and see what kind of mischief they have gotten up to. Here we find the boys hiding behind their little barricade with a trap laid out with a boar here as a bait for their tall tail monster. By the beast fangs, you're right, we gotta kill him. So here the boys explain that they are trying to hunt down the grottle, believing that its guts are made of gold and if they kill it they would be able to be set for life. Ah. Fantastic. So uh, we're going to persuade them that the Grotel does not exist and be able to get a set of saddlebags. There we are. And if we inspect the trap, this is the Grotel trap. The pig used as bait looks somewhat confused. Um, we'll just we'll just imagine that we let him go. Do remember that uh, clearing out the mines for all their iron is an excellent source of income. It's necessary for being able to craft your own weapons and armor, armor improvements. And what I like to do is just knock out a whole bunch of um, the lockpicks out of the Tinkerer because you can do that basically for free. And then you can sell all those excess lockpicks for quite a nice little chunk of change when you go into any merchant. Also, if you have a leveled up character, then you're able to have a chance of finding uh, rare gemstones. I'm trying to find if there's anything else in this area. It doesn't look like it, so let's head out. And let's go back to the stable to see what has become of the boys. Now we can speak to the lady of the stables. I'm so glad to have my stable boys back. Thank you for bringing those gullible fools back in one piece. And we gain an extra 50 crowns. And the stable boys pretend they, they have no idea who we are. And the minstrel is actually gone. I wonder if we shall encounter him again. Our next misadventure is going to take us across the river to the Juggler's Camp. This is right across from um, Brown Rock Town. If we show the map, it's going to be right here. 
the wild animal tamer. So let's go hop over and see what is happening at this little group, uh, the small circus. Trisme says that he is a animal trainer and has trained a wolf to be able to do tricks and that's his livelihood, but the wolf has now escaped. Everyone else is wondering how the wolf could have escaped. If you inspect the cage, then it, you actually find a lockpick over here and uh, you realize that a human must have let the wolf go. So the Trisme says, if you ever find the wolf, please bring him back. He is tame, he knows tricks, and he wears a collar to be able to distinguish him. To be able to find our juggler's missing animal companion, simply go out to this beach if we show the map. Juggler's camp is right here, head along the road past the castle, right next to Merman's fishery. And we find the lone wolf gazing out into the water. The wolf may not be very large, but does seem to have eaten more than its fill on too many occasions. Around its neck hangs a little tag that reads, Wolfie. Wow, how original. So we can attack and try and capture Wolfie. The trick here is actually going to be <laughs> not just killing Wolfie. We need to capture him. Okay, he's got 58 health, but he does have fragility added in from knife, meaning that he's going to take an extra 30% damage. So... <laughs> How are we going to engage him? We have to cut his health down and then be able to get another companion in alongside to do the capture. Axe is out. Axe is just going to crit and uh, annihilate this poor wolf. Maybe it's actually Knife who comes in? As long as you don't crit, my friend, we should be fine. Oh, we did crit, but it was it just it's just right. Here we go. All right, Axe comes in from behind. We get the capture option. You have to have rope to be able to do this. And non-lethal, we have captured Wolfie. Why do we get wolf meat? Why, why would we get wolf meat? Wolfie is not just your standard animal companions. Coming in at level five is pretty good. They're gonna be leveled to the party and they actually keep the leader tag. So it's gonna be an extra powerful animal companion if you choose to keep them. Back to the juggler, we can return Wolfie in exchange for a lyre and a collar of unity. Oh my Wolfie, my little one. I was so worried I'd never see him again and yet here he is. Thank you, mercenaries. I have found my purpose again. Take this. It's my most prized possession, after Wolfie, of course. A collar imbued with the scent of its wearer's peers. An animal accessory. Okay, okay. So right now my wolf is using saddlebags to be able to increase his carrying capacity by 10, which is kind of hilarious. But if we do this, a collar imbued with the scent of its wearer's peers. Well, when we get into combat, hopefully it becomes apparent what this does. Aha, here it is, this shows up, the double bounty, yep. So I fought the Colonel Alex Graham once, but I get to cash in two bounties because I have these, these two papers with his picture on it, look. And the same person pays me both. That's the amazing thing is the emissaries both give unique quests, but they will pay for the other person's quest to be completed. And now we're gonna do the same thing for freeing the flooded mine. Oh, I love this game. Ascending up the mountains here in the very northwestern corner of the map brings us to the iron mine up here. It's really nice that the mines are next to each other. I like being able to hit those for cash runs. But here we come upon a manager at the end of his wits with a bunch of miners who are going on strike asking for better health care and uh, more time off. So we can side with either way, either persuading them to go ahead and keep on working for the uh, the manager here, or we can threaten him to actually give the miners what they want. This will increase our wanted level, um, but we will also be able to receive a little bit more rewards. If you side with the miners, you get a backpack accessory that is really unique. We get a sieve. Gemstones won't escape through this fine mesh strainer. Troop bonus increases the chance of finding gemstones when mining. If instead we persuade on the side of getting the miners to work uh, for the boss, then we lose our influence. Not that influence is, puts you in too much of a pinch, but now if we go back and actually talk to the boss, he's feeling a lot better. Obviously, you know how to handle such situations. We get a bunch of crowns and a little bit of influence back. I feel like the backpack accessory is probably worth more than the 100 crowns up front. 
But the nice thing is that either way you go, you will be able to start working the mine yourself and bring in that iron ore, which can be such a big cash grab for you. Out here in this corner of the map, we have a few final really interesting secrets. So you can walk along this ridge all the way to the end. Then you can set down a python that you'll be able to follow down. I hope I'm saying that right. Let me know in the comments how you say python. Python, that sounds right. You can find a border pass here at this secret, manual first aid and manual sprint. So these are base level skills that you will be able to teach to your companions. Another way you can find these books is if you reach a high enough level in the path of crime and chaos and you get access to the black market and its agents in the region of Tiltran and I believe in all regions. Once you liberate the main bandit's lair, then the black market agent will appear there and he will sell you these skill manuals. But here we pick up some for free. If you already have the skills and you don't really want it, like I don't really use sprint ever, you can still sell it for a lot of crowns. And the same thing with the border pass. If you've already unlocked all the borders, it sells for a lot. I feel like Stab here is going to learn first aid. I like first aid on the characters that don't engage enemies very often. And so the, uh, the pikemen, the archers, all great candidates for that. The ranger would also be a good option, I suppose. Especially because the ranger has usually very good mobility to be able to get across the battlefield. The archers with limited mobility. Maybe not as useful, though I've gotten movement point ups on most of my archers now so they can get around quite a bit. And then another piece we have here is this little this little bunch of boars that are in combat with some poor farmer down here. Oh my, look at these huge pigs. It reminds me of my parents' pigsty back in the day. As a child, it was often up to me to feed the beasts. Come here, you little piggies. My eyesight isn't what it used to be. The boars look enraged, famished, and ready to charge. You can just feed them if you have grapes in inventory, or you can try and fight them back. Here we will have to keep the old man alive, and we're fighting the boars with the dominant sow. So in Tiltrin, you had the unique wolf. Here we have the dominant sow. Well, they didn't give her a special name or anything, but here is the queen boar, 112 health, double what her allies have. Oh boy. What's her damage here? Savage Impalement deals 16 to 20 damage to the target. Critical hit guaranteed if the target is already engaged with an ally and is a forest guardian. Each time an allied animal dies, this unit gains fury. So that's the same for all the boars. The queen boar with her really high health pool is a prime target to be taken down by status effects if you're gonna have trouble stacking up the damage though. Without any guard value or armor value, getting through her should be pretty easy. They, they slaughtered the pigs, please. I don't want to die like these poor beasts. Here, take everything I have, but please spare my life. I gain a trumpet. Listen, we didn't have to take the old crazy man's trumpet, guys. Oh, okay, so. It's intended for people with hearing difficulties, which makes me feel even worse about taking it from the poor old man. But it means that we can put our ear to the locks and make locks easier to pick. I believe what this means is that when you are lock picking, if you want details on the lock picking, I have a guide out for it. But there is a V-shaped channel you have to get the lock pick into. And some locks, the channel is narrower than others. And I believe that this will just make it a, uh, a wider zone for success, a wider sweet spot for all the locks. And there goes the sheriffs. I guess they were going to help him. Too late, guys. Here at the Winfield Estate, we have the Wedding Banquet Quest. You're able to inspect over here. Do you want to add flowers to the bride's crown? Well, we've had a very tumultuous relationship with the bride after kidnapping her and all. So <laughs> you can... Give flowers to be able to gain influence. And of course, you can also steal the flowers right back. <laughs> oh, what a thing. And then here we could donate some cured meat to the banquet feast. We'll go ahead. We're loaded up on cured meats. Gain a little bit more influence. And you can talk to the, uh, the super happy parents. Well, he thinks about postponing the wedding because the, uh, the crops are all blighted and dying. But uh, the mother is pretty happy. And that's all there. The, the wedding banquet is very straightforward. The Virtusian Jail, if we pull up the map, 
located right in this zone, is not only the hub for being able to make you a lot of money if you sell prisoners over, but it is also the location of a mysterious prison breakout. So you can hand over your prisoners as usual right here to the guard behind the counter, and you can talk to this guard to pick up the quest line of trying to figure out where the prisoners have gone. Now there is an extra piece to this. I have forgotten who you talk to, but there is there's somebody at one of these random homesteads that says their nephew or their son had gone to visit friends in jail and had not returned, potentially part of the breakout. This guy is the one prisoner who remains. You can choose to recruit him, but he says that he won't rat on his friends. Oh no, the lady mayoress, you've been thrown in jail for all your embezzlement. You don't know what it's like not to be re-elected. I was going to lose everything because of those blasted sewers. No, we fixed the sewers. Too bad you can't recruit her. That would be an epic turn to the story that from mayor to mercenary, maybe in a DLC. The large rock here in the corner highlights when you hover over it so you know you can interact. Throw in your miner and we can tear this down. Now we can find an escape tunnel. Someone dug a hole in the jail floor. It's too dark to see where it leads. Well, we go on down using rope. From here, we seem to have another prisoner that we can speak with. I broke my leg while trying to escape the jail, and my accomplices left me behind the gutless oafs. I'll tell you everything I know if you give me some medicine. So we can just convince her with a little bit of influence, or we can go ahead and heal her up, which I'm going to do. We'd been digging together for weeks. They said we were going to form a gang and set up our lair in the abandoned sawmill near the Tiltron border. But when they saw I broke my leg, they abandoned me without a second thought. Dispatch them or take them back to jail and let them rot there. I'd be most grateful. So we can try to recapture her or we can spare her and just let her go. We're going to go ahead and let her go. I think that we've learned everything we need to and we can head back on up. Now this actually drops us out here at the dark cave rather than back up in the jail. And you get this little zone with a few extra goodies. I believe you can also reach this zone if you throw down a python. Inspecting the campfire here gives us Companion's Two-Handed Mace, level 5. The mere sight of this mace is enough to make smugglers a breakout in a cold sweat. Not sure what the uh, would-be criminals would be doing with this, but uh, I will take it and sell it. Sorry if the transition looks like garbage because we're doing an addendum to the Vertruse prison. When you drop down, there is one more thing you should really go for, and it is this barrel right here. I think my inventory window before was working against me and blocking it, but this is where you can grab Alazarian powder. As far as I'm aware, this is the only location you can find this guy, and it is essential for some of the apothecary crafting, such as blinding powder or the hand bomb. I'm sure there's a few other uses as well, and when we get the full release, I am sure that there's going to be another way that we're able to find this. But until then, make sure that you don't miss it, like like I did initially. Oh, here it is. So this, it's hard to see. I missed it the first time. This rope will get you back up to the jail, and then clicking over here takes you out to that other extra zone. Let's go back up to the jail, and let's go ahead and speak over here. Okay, we can't progress it yet. The old sawmill is back here, right next to the Tiltron border, just like the criminal said. And if you have already been there, then you see a bunch of very shabbily dressed characters milling around, not using the sawmill. And uh, they just seem very, very conspicuous. The old sawmill here, right on the Tiltron border, is populated with these extremely suspicious criminals. Hello, mercenaries. Ah, oh, you know who we are. So that wino ratted us out, eh? We should have slashed your throat when we had a chance. So the convicts are willing to pay you to get the, you off their backs, or you can attack and try and recapture as many as possible. Taking the 60 crowns is straightforward enough, though if you choose to fight them, it seems like their numbers have been significantly bolstered than the four guys who actually escaped from jail. As I was loading into battle, I realized I only have three sets of irons rather than four, so we're not going to be able to capture all of you guys. Some are just going to have to be put down in the ground. Oh boy, I just remembered I'm supposed to be capturing these guys, not wiping them out. Okay, we'll try and finagle capturing these last few. My damage is just too high! 
can't help but kill him. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Moving in next to the archer, bringing up the poison strike. It's just not, they're not below half yet. I could wait for them to take their turn and then the bleeding poison combo would be able to bring them down below half. I think we'll do that. So we pass knife's turn. Now we want to engage another one of these guys. Unfortunately, who does the engaging? Is it tough? Okay, don't kill this one, tough. I know you often will. Okay, good, they're pretty durable. Not if we crit. All right, that was just right. Here comes the punch from the archer. Damage over time, dropping them below half. Just what I wanted. Now, uh, stabby stab. Come on up. Knock them out. Very good. Uh, do I want them to do anything else? Honestly, stab, just uh, hang tight right now. Now, what's your movement? Oh, yes. Archers with the upgraded movement. It feels good. Knock them out. That's two of the three I'm able to capture. Okay, who will be the final capture victim? The archer wants to go next. I wonder if we go after them. I think we could. We can throw tough in here. Are you gonna crit again? Oh, you don't crit. So this is where it gets awkward because Another attack will kill them, rather than allow me to capture them. Alternatively, uh, okay, so we take knife. We run knife around behind. I can use the torch strike, which is a uh, heavy damage penalty. Doesn't do a lot. Drops them below half, and it doesn't count as a primary action. So, wait, why do I not have, why don't I have the option to capture? Okay, well, oh, it's because they're the named character. You, you can't capture named characters even though the mission is explicitly to recapture these named characters. Uh, do we use the wolf? Or do we use... I feel like uh, Archer just kills them here. Oh, is this, is this it? So I get 14 damage. Is 14 enough? No, 14 would not be enough. Okay, okay, so we gotta find something else. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe this hoodlum just dies and we go for capturing this marauder instead. Okay, they're in range. Oh no. If they attack multiple enemies, I mean, they also knocked him back, so they're not able to engage. Okay, here they come. Yep, sure, through the burning. Makes sense. And they don't engage him. Well. You'll never take me alive, I suppose. I'd rather die than go back to jail. Well, we got two of them. Could have done better. Otherwise, there is nothing you can interact with here at the sawmill. Back to the jail, we return with our prize, or, you know, some of the people who escaped. <laughs> Talking to the guard here. You found them? By St. Leonard's Hammer. I don't know who St. Leonard is. I'm picking up some of the religion of the game, but not all of it. You made short work of that. Take this reward, you deserve it. If you were merciful enough to take some of them alive, you can speak to my colleague and claim their bounties. So we gain 75 crowns for solving the prison break, and then we're able to hand over the prisoners, and you get just the uh, the standard payment. So the crowns is scaled based on the level of the prisoners, and the extra 20 influence that you see here is a perk that you unlock through one of the paths achievements? Yes, untouchables here. So after you make 2,000 crowns selling prisoners, you are going to gain 20 influence for all future prisoners that you sell. Man, some of these titles are duds, like here, Crowns Earned. That doesn't have any bonus, but some of these other ones have awesome bonuses. Look at this. Selling trade goods gives you influence. Man, trade in wealth. And I want another chain, just because I'm used to having four. And another rope, so I have a neat ten because of my OCD. Right next door to the jail, to the guard's eternal chagrin, I am sure, is the Sentinel Tower. This tower is occupied by the bandits initially, so pick up the bounties to be able to knock the bandits out of here. And once you drive them away, which I've already done, you get the lair. Usually, there's some really interesting things to loot here, but instead, this time, we just have Odwit the Fisherman. 
Sorry to be a bother, but would you mind untying me? <laughs> sure. Sure, Oddwit. There we go, now let's talk to him. Ah, thanks a lot. I couldn't feel my ankles. Try as I might, these shackles were too strong. Ironically, I was stuck here because of a key. When the bandits saw it, they figured that I was rich, even though I have no idea what it actually opens. It's a family heirloom that we keep as a mere lucky charm. If you want it, you're welcome to it. It has completely failed its purpose. So here we gain the ornate key. I'll go back to my fishery now. It's not far from Smart's Arena. If you ever happen to go there, come and pay me a visit. Coming in to uh, Merman's Fishery, which is just as you said, south of Smart's Arena. We can hop over to the fishery, set your angler to fish off the dock, and you will actually pull up the chest that you can then use the ornate key on, and we can find the contents. Fragments of a precious item. The pieces of this object attest to its former greatness. A scholar could repair this. We'll grab that. I can't believe it. You came. Make yourselves at home. Your family now. He doesn't care that we pulled up. <laughs> Uh, the chest and then used his family's key to open up the heirloom. Okay, so this is something that you get to use the lectern and your scholar for. So we place the item over here for research. The, uh, the header of the item, what color it is, will show a little bit about its rarity and also how long it is going to take for the scholar to work on it. It's going to show a little bit about its rarity. We find Hatchet over here, who is our novice scholar. So he's going to start to work on that. We will pull, probably pull the cook back to the campfire. Do some rearranging here so that our scholar can busy himself. And every time you rest, he will be able to make a little bit of progress. We'll check back in once we finally uncover that item. Once our not-so-brilliant scholar here, Hatchet, has pieced together the pieces of the family heirloom that we picked up from the fisherman, we receive the military medal. Worth 105 crowns, it is a piece of antiquity uh, that the, the purpose seems to be that you just sell it. There was only a few more encounters to show off, and here we pick up the tracker's quest, the hunt in Vertrus. The beast that killed this poor woman must have been huge. A bloody trail leads away from the corpse. So the trackers give you the hunt information, but the hunt is going to say, go to the half-eaten corpse south of Rochebrun Cave. Well, that's the French translation of Brown Rock Mine. So you need to be over here, and here we can already see the Phantom Swarm is appearing. We have approached here at night. Oh, no. No, the dawn. The dawn's light, and they've left. All right. Well, now we get to nose around here until nightfall and see where our quarry will appear. Now that it is nightfall, the hunt has appeared. So... This is actually separate from the randomized ghost hunt. So here we see the random ghost hunt right over here, but the hunt that the trackers specifically want us to go after appears right here in this little clearing right next to the, the pond that feeds the waterfall. Very picturesque. And um, I'm terrified because these are level six. And we're fighting the phantom boar. Usually you have to fight a nightmare who is bad enough. What is this gonna be? Hey, look at this. They're doing us a favor. We don't have to fight in the fog. That actually is a big deal because the creepy fog that gives you terror and limits your movement and obscures the enemies is really part of the challenge of fighting the Phantom Swarm, I feel like. And so just removing that makes this encounter much less intimidating. I'm going to open up with the Cutting Maelstrom right here on Hatchet. He actually picks up a, uh, a feet point there, that's amazing. Then we're gonna run him up to be able to slam into this boar, be able to do a little, uh, come on. Extra point five, there we go. Clip the boar. All right, that boar wants to go next. Can we get him any assistance? It doesn't really look like it. Let's throw Axe down here to be able to deal with this guy who also wants to go on the next initiative. We'll drop him with a casual one, two, three hit there. Hatchet takes a point of terror, and now this wolf wants to play. Does Stab reach? Stab does not reach. Okay, who's next? This Ghost Wolf? Eh, we can play for that Ghost Wolf, I suppose. We'll bring Jav on up, throw the Impale, and then use Spear Wall to be able to keep him from, keep him honest, keep him from doing any funny business. 
Wolf jumps in onto Axe, just damage on the armor. You want to make sure that they're not hitting unarmored targets, because that prevents the bleed from spreading all over. Alright, we're going to throw Tough just up against this boar. See if we can take them down. We get the Valor Point for engaging, and then we can drop all our abilities to be able to kill the boar. Now the wolf goes straight into the spear wall, dropping him instantly. Very nice combo. I love those abilities. This one, I believe, is going to be out of range. Ooh, but he does miss the bear trap. Well, clever positioning, Mr. Boar. Now for these two. Um, I guess I can still go after them here. Throw the jab. Do I want to spend spear throw? It... It doesn't kill- Oh, with the crit, it kills him outright. I was gonna say, it doesn't kill him outright, but because it would apply the bleed, he would die after he takes his turn this way. With the crit, it makes it even cleaner. He doesn't get any damage off whatsoever. Who do we want to help with, uh, with Wolf here? I think we wait for these guys to advance to get more into our range, so we will throw Wolfie's turn. I should stop calling him Wolfie, because <laughs> as we found out, Wolfie is a NPC, a named wolf. Oh, you gotta love those opportunity attacks. The archers do so well in this combat because the enemies don't have any any armor values, so we just get a lot of work, I feel like. More work out of the archers against the animals than against the other enemies. It might also be because they usually come in swarms. I don't know exactly, but that's just my, uh, my perception. But it looks like this battle is going to actually be significantly easier than fighting the normal Phantom Swarm because they got no reinforcements on round two, which you usually have to face, and they got no Nightmare. It looks like you just have to clear out the, uh, the Phantoms and then you're good to go. One more left and we will down him with the Poison Knife. Da da da! Be able to loot all of these goodies and Hatchet gets, oh he leveled up and he got the title, the Wolf Tamer. The Wolf Tanner. Very different thing. Coming right back to the Tracker's camp, we were able to speak with the Master here. To be honest, I didn't think you'd make it back alive, but obviously I misjudged you. Not only did you survive, but you also defeated the Phantom Swarm. This armor layer is yours. So he gives us, where is it? The reinforced layer of the rat. Critical hit plus 2%. And then movement zero. I don't know why it's specifying movement zero. And of course he also gives us the blueprint so that we can forge this on our own. This opens up some really interesting crit build possibilities, especially for the archers, because if you are lucky enough to be able to pick up one of the bows off the guard captains where you get double shots if you crit, then going all in on the crit stat can really pay off. Oh man, another day of recording and the devs throw an entire new update for us to figure out. So we started out at negative five happiness because why not? Also, all our food supplies is completely trashed because they reworked how food works. All of your companion's consumption is higher, but then the food value on all foodstuffs is also higher except for cured meat, which is what we put our entire stock of supplies into. So it's this is the effect of inflation right here. We're getting runaway inflation even in War Tales. Then what really gets me, the best thing, is they added a brand new skill. If you go to the knowledge tree, you can learn location markers. You can now write on your own map. Your mercenaries had no idea how to do that before. I was actually yesterday searching for the final secret to be able to show off to you guys in this region. And I was wondering, how am I ever going to remember where it is? It's right, it's right here. It's right here. And I was like, this one was easy because you threw a python down to be able to get to it. This one, I threw this python down on a random nearby cliff just because, oh, I know that'll show up on the map. Could have waited a couple hours and just used the marker. I'm not going to go back and do the other ones with this because I believe you guys are smart enough to be able to figure out where the secrets are that have already shown off. But I am definitely going to use it from now on. And the amazing thing is that, look at this, it shows up on your main screen so that you know the direction to go. Ah, I love it. The final point on this detour of the new update is that they actually added an encounter here in Vertruce. So if you talk to Orinon, Ryan, the the hair pusher seller in the middle of the market, and you buy one of these potions, he claims that it will grow the hair back on your bald companions. Now, do note that for this purpose of the new update, 
Happiness is now cumulative. When you rest, you're able to gain happiness. Also, the effects of the potion require your character to rest. And resting at an inn does not count. You have to rest in camp. All right, here we go, Hatchet. You bald, beautiful man. Hair regrowth. According to the label, it says you need to rest to be able to view the effects. All right, well, let's throw up camp. And let's start eating our useless, useless cured meat. So, they rebalanced meat. Like, pork here used to only be worth two food. Now it's worth four. So, in that sense, things scaled just right. But, cured meat stayed at one. Oh, fungi's higher. Okay, go back, go back. Pay our wages. Wages are now higher as well. And we will rest. The thing is that the meat drying rack now creates more cured meat. So, it's still... It's... It should be balanced if you were creating the new stuff, but it's, like I said, inflation has uh, pulled down our whole stock of provisions. Oh no, what happened to Hatchet? If we inspect him now, Sting, Strength and Dexterity, reduced by 30%. And uh, if we break camp, we should get a little note here. Am I an idiot and I just missed it? I've seen it. There's a note that pops up that says, instead of a luscious head of hair, there's red patchy itchy sensation and we've been had by the snake oil salesman if we go back to the market you are now able to attack him for selling fake product and he's a level five swordsman with no weapons so the combat is a pushover all right there's hatchet good i want to make sure he's the one who can get his revenge all right tough knock him down a peg Use obliteration to seal. <laughs> he just sold us a, a bad product. This happens all the time. You can loot his possessions. I'm going to leave the hair pusher where it is. And now we will have to treat with medicine the, uh, the wayward recipient of the hair growth potion. No, please. I'm sorry. I'll leave. You'll never hear from me again. Here, take today's receipt and let me go. We gain 50 crowns, and he is nowhere to be found. That's not going to even appear on the list of encounters here in Marhem, but I wanted to be able to show that off because it's brand new and it fit in with the guide for this region. The last secret location here in Vertrus is right in the very corner of the map. Let's pull it up again. I threw down the marker right here, so by the rat infestation, <laughs> by this python on the path. But there's a cliff here, so you're going to have to enter via way of the Loop Vineyard Fields. And if you follow them all the way nestled up against the mountain, you get a little campfire and a chest that says inspect. And here we are. We find another skill mastery book. Ugh, these are so good. And of course, if you've already mastered all the skills that you want on your party, hang on to them until you get a new party member or just sell them for a lot of crowns. They are a wonderful treasure to be able to find. Because we have the update available now, we can talk a little bit more about what was added. They have multiple buildings inside castles now, so you can enter the castle, which will bring you to the same room that you saw before. Wait, wait, wait. What is happening? Oh my gosh, because of the update, it reset the dialogue as you enter in. That's amazing. So here is the lady of the other house in her prisoner garb with every, all the other characters here. That's, that's hilarious. Okay, but this is the room that you have been used to seeing. And then we also have a forge attached, which is wonderful because it means you get an all-purpose merchant and access to an anvil. Oh, uh, the rebalance didn't help out carcasses. I used to get so much more food out of those after a hunt. We have two final encounters to show off in Vertrus, and they happen to be right next to each other. Here is the Children of the Beast camp, a very unique location. You're going to pick up bounties that say hoodlums are using the Children of the Beast camp as a base of operations. When you approach, the defenders of the camp are worried about you having been sent by the Inquisition to burn them out. So you can either persuade them that you don't work for the Inquisition, or you can start a battle. Whichever way you choose to get in, the Children of the Beast have a wonderful little camp here with a couple little surprises for us. You can grab this trap if you want to steal it from them. They have a, uh, a merchant here able to sell you some wonderful baked meals. And we've got this locked box. The locked box is just full of some foodstuffs. The real interesting piece here is that they have this magnificent tapestry 
used as a tent covering. You don't touch that, it's ours. So we can either threaten them to be able to take the tapestry, we can attack them to be able to grab the tapestry, or we can once again spend our influence to persuade them to give it over. However you manage to grab the tapestry, this will allow you to move her across to Master Geralt's Drapery, where you can return the tapestry to its rightful and very distraught owner. Do note that if you choose the peaceful resolution for all of the scenarios, you will not be able to initiate combat, and thus you will not be able to pick up the bounty that is set up for clearing the Children of the Beast camp. Returning to Master Gerald's Drapery, if we pull up the map once again, it is right here. It's not going to be labeled with any quest chain, but nonetheless, when we speak to him, we are able to give over the precious tapestry, and we will acquire an embroidered handkerchief that's going to be a backpack accessory. But that's my tapestry! Words cannot express how grateful I am. I hope this reward speaks for itself. And now he's happy, which should be reward in and of itself. Also, it's pretty awesome that you have a, a shopkeeper over here. Be able to drop off some extra items. Also, they have a chest hiding in the background that you can use a lockpick for. It's covered up by that drapery. Inside is nothing too special, but remember, after you pick locks, taking the items inside is not considered stealing, so it's just ours now. Hey, listen, do you want some of the sandstone? No, I don't, I don't remember where I picked it up. The embroidered handkerchief gives you a chance that a stolen item will not be considered stolen. This is a big deal if you are going heavy into the thievery. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's nice to be able to wear. It looks good, it looks cute. The bandits in Vertruz function the exact same as in Tiltran and all the other regions. They're going to have multiple hideouts, one in the Sentinel Tower, one in the Flooded Mine, and as long as you clear the bandits out of those locations, then the defenders at the main bandits lair will be severely weakened. I highly recommend going through all of their outposts because they have incredible loot left behind for you to be able to pick over. Also here at the Sentinel Tower, you're able to pick up the Unlucky Charm, which allows you to complete the quest over at Merman's Fishery. If, however, you want to really test your metal against an enormous number of enemies, go straight for the lair. You can clear out the smaller ones later, and you can take this at its highest difficulty. To give you an idea of what you will be up against, we are going to be fighting 16 level 5 enemies, and that is with it fully weakened. I'm not sure if this still works as of the update patch that they just pushed today, but for the previous outpost, I was able to collect double bounties for it, picking up bounties from the emissary in the main town, and then picking up bounties from the emissary in Brown Rock Village. Those emissaries will pay out the rewards for any quest, but they actually hand out their own unique quests, which means that they can overlap on the same locations, which was amazing. The goal with fighting a lot of enemies is to try and position your units so that there are going to be pockets of enemy reinforcements that will have to waste multiple turns to actually get involved in the battle. So focusing down a group of enemies that are close to where your characters can spawn in is generally the key to victory. Let's see if we can drop this Marauder before he takes a turn here. Use the spear throw, get that enormous initial damage, and then roll into obliteration to drop him. There we go. Take away as many turns that the enemies get on the first turn as possible, and that will snowball things heavily in your favor. Ooh, that was your best swing? You couldn't have hit multiple targets with that swing? I'm pretty sure you could have. Pretty sure you could have gotten multiple targets with that swing. Just didn't want to, I guess. Save them for next time. Uh, yeah, I'll use a rat to be able to finish off this hoodlum. Numbers are finally starting to even out. We'll push. Oh, I wanted to go all the way, but there's a bear trap right there. All right. Well, let's not step on the bear trap. But still get into a better position here. Snipe. Snipe with the, uh, the bomber bow is so good. Look at the range on this. I can reach out and I can still clip this guy. And we started out way over here. Everything is going according to plan. These enemies all had to waste their turn approaching, as did these enemies. And these ones are just now... It looks like some of the ones in the very back will not be in range, but the ones in front will be able to fully engage here. We've got poachers and hoodlums going next. What is our response? I think that we lay into these poachers with hatchet and we just do away with them. I hate the poachers. Popping into your armor, knocking you around, breaking up engagements. Hit him with the cutting maelstorm. 
Now, because we're attacking multiple enemies, we're not actually going to be able to engage with them, but I get valor points for striking multiple enemies, so I want to do it anyway. And now we can actually, we could throw the taunt, which will both weaken him and prevent him from being able to use his bow, so uh, that's going to be the sorriest little punch you ever did see. Now, over here, I don't think the hoodlum is able to get across. I wanted to be able to throw up the spear wall. Oh, uh, I guess, okay, here's the play, here's the play. We run up, we impale this marauder, and then we continue, cut all the way up to here, stand right next to this poacher, and we put the spear wall here so that as he tries to move, we're still able to lock him in place, even with a crit, that's pretty fancy. There it is, one damage, <laughs> the weakened punch from the poacher. I don't think this guy has a future in boxing. Now we want to be able to deal with this marauder. Uh, what's the play? Is it is it stab? I think we use stab here. Uh, he's not gonna have enough damage, unfortunately. Whoa! What the crit he does? What the crit he has the exact number. He had 36 health. That's so good. Then I think we kind of just wrap around and be able to create some spacing because these enemies are coming in. We want to be able to engage with them, um, but not open ourselves up to a hit attack being able to hit multiple multiple ones of our characters. We don't want multiple companions being able to go down with a single blow. We will thin them out. Let them walk into Axe's range. That's the idea. So we'll retreat knife just a little bit. I don't want him getting bogged down with an engagement. I want him free to be able to move around the outside. Oh, he didn't... That's strange. Why wouldn't you use obliteration? Like, you had two targets. Sometimes the AI just doesn't understand what is going on, I think. It makes me feel a little bad. It's not like I don't want to be playing on easy mode here, you know? What does it take to be able to get a flaming arrow on multiple targets out there? Now, I want to be able to move him in toward this portion of the fight because we've got poisoned allies and our sources of first aid are snipe and jab. But at the same time, I could launch a flaming arrow to be able to hit multiple targets if I fire over here, which I think is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> the support character who does not support. It's a little cliche, but that seems to be what's going on. Who is next? This poacher caught up in the fire, also bleeding, because snipe causes bleeding when they get land a crit. That's uh, amazing. An amazing combo. I wish that when you selected enemies who had already gone, they would have their things grayed out to show that they've already taken a turn. Because otherwise, it's just a memory game. And it's not a very fun one. Alright, slice and dice. See what we can do to this marauder. We get the engagement, which will give us a valor point. Rampage to pinwheel this monstrous axe into him. Get the crit. There. The crit grants fury, so we get extra damage on the next attack. We'll keep Axe, he's hurt, his armor's going down, but when they engage with him, we get the Valor points. So we'll keep it up. Jab getting shot point blank, but 22 return damage for the combo, bleeding and fire. All right, let's see, let's make sure we run around the trap, because we were so careful to position initially. Hit him with the pound, shatter the armor. Is that enough for Wrath to kick in? Oh no, it's not enough for Wrath. Oh, well, there we go. We have the movement to be able to... No, we don't. We'll get him next time, tough. We'll get him next time. I've just been kind of trying to baby the wolf because I don't I don't want him to go down. I'm trying to protect my dog. If he gets hit another time because your animal companions don't go down to dying, they just die. You don't have a chance to bring him back. He's been with us a long time. He's not been particularly useful, but I've still grown attached to him. <laughs> I didn't even name him. He's still the wolf. Why am I so attached to him? Ooh, 87 damage on the crit. All right, Twang. All right, showing off for us now. <laughs> hey, these poachers are going to try and go again. Yeah, I don't think Hatchet is going to allow that. Here comes the obliteration. Drops them both. And then... We're gonna go, we're gonna go all out here. We're gonna go ham. Run straight into the fire, throw Cutting Mailstorm to drop both of these guys. <laughs> we get galvanized and he cheers and then he swings again. Oh, we can even run back out of the fire, it's so good. 
Okay, final two. Bow on bow. Can you hit another crit just like that, Twang? Show off again for me. Oh, no. That was... It wasn't even a crit, and he did 68 damage. Well, in that case, Axe will have to do it. Come on, big boy. Slice and dice. Yeah, and there's demoralized. Do we let him go? No, we don't. We move right in, and we hit him with the rampage. Nobody left alive here in the bandit outpost. We can loot to our heart's content. Look at all this stuff. I'm pretty sure these are all at my level, though. What's nice is when you get to fight the uh, the level 6 enemies. You actually get level 6 loot. The only thing that's giving me upgrades right now. But here is the bandit's lair. And as you guys will remember, if you were watching my previous guide, when you get to the bandit lairs, if you have gone down the path of crime and chaos up to level 4, access to the black market and its agents, you will be able to see a black market agent appear once you have cleared the bandit lair. Aw, oh, this is great. In the Tiltron one, the camera doesn't look at him. It looks at a dead body of a bandit, and it's so random. So we can pick up the Velvet Pouch, which we of course will, and then these are very interesting skill manuals. So they will allow you to teach the basic level skills to any of your companions. So Hatchet here has Taunt, whereas, say, Axe has Wrath. You can teach whatever skills you want, in addition to the... You, you can't get duplicate skills, I don't think, but you can uh, keep on getting the full variety. You can add first aid onto different characters because it's really good to have first aid wherever you need it, just for that, uh, that extra option. You will also be able to sell stolen goods here with no penalty to suspicion. Usually when you try and fence stolen goods at an honest merchant, then you will get an extra increase in suspicion. So you get hit with this double whammy of you got suspicion when you stole the item and you get suspicion when you sell the item. So then it feels like you just want to steal useful items but if you have access to the black market, you can turn that stealing around into making money. You're gonna wanna go around very carefully to, oh, this is the black market agent. He eats candied fruit. Okay, that's appropriate. We'll leave him the candied fruit. I'm gonna loot the whole zone. Here we've gotten even more blueprints, and then we're gonna go over what all these blueprints are that we've picked up. These belt and backpack accessories, I believe are randomized, but Make sure that you find them because they are often very powerful. I keep hovering over this chest because I feel like I should have to lockpick something in this zone, but it is not giving me any interaction. It just keeps on highlighting the fire pit. All right, what have you got for us? So from the black market agent, blueprint velvet pouch. This is a backpack accessory that will increase the durability of lockpicks by 20%. So if you have had any kind of annoyance with the lockpicking game, it's not too complicated once you understand what is definitely going on there, but you just are tired of breaking lockpicks, go for the velvet pouch. Honestly, the velvet pouch seems a little conspicuous for a, a thief pouch, but you do you. Next, we found the tooth collar, teeth embedded in a leather strap. So this is going to be an animal accessory that will increase their critical damage by 10%. If you are going heavily down the Beastmaster path, then I feel like this is kind of a must. Also, in a future update, they are promising that they are going to bring skills into your animals and fully flesh out that zone of gameplay. So this could become even more beneficial as we get further updates to the game. The salt scoop is a backpack accessory that will reduce the cost in salt of all dishes by 1%. I have actually already picked one of these up, so I've been using it even though I didn't know how to craft it, and it's not gotten too much mileage for me. Salt is a base ingredient for all the cooking that you do, so if you do a ton of cooking to be able to stretch out your rations, the salt scoop could be something you could consider going for, but just 1%... I feel like it doesn't really matter, especially because salt is so cheap. And it's incredibly plentiful. At any market, you're going to be able to pick up 40 salt, and it's going to refresh on those merchants very consistently. So I feel like this, if you have other backpack accessories, are going to push the salt scoop out of your companion's accessories. All right, I said we were going to leave him as candied fruit. We're not going to leave him as candied fruit. We're just going to take it and run. What are you going to do about it? 
Do note that once you have crafted the salt scoop, you unlock the recipe for the cooking ladle, which will give you a chance to retrieve resources used in cooking, which seems much more valuable than the salt scoop itself. That is everything, and I do mean everything you can possibly do here in Vertrus. Of course, let me know in the comments if you think I missed anything. Back in my Tiltron guide, I had one secret that I was unable to figure out how to reach because I didn't understand how pythons work, but after the comments, I was able to figure that out, and for this region, I really think that I didn't miss anything. To be able to pick up all the location check marks, my save is now bugged as of the update. The fate of Vertrus is not marking as complete after they reworked the castles and did the update, and then to be able to pick up the other check marks, you're going to have to clear out the rat infestations. If you want to see those combats, check out my guide to Tiltron. I go through a combat with the rats and also with the Phantom Hunt if you are interested in seeing how to take down those phantom monsters and gain that oh-so-precious white leather. If you enjoy this kind of comprehensive guide, then support the channel, subscribe, leave a like, and until next time, thank you guys for watching. Have a good one.